Assalamu alaikum friends welcome to lecture 2 of SBL this lecture is also under leadership and my first lecture was also under leadership the section A topic of the syllabus under this we are going to cover professionalism ethical codes and public interest this is a big lecture okay it's a very big lecture uh, it consists of more than 120 slides so you can understand the length of this lecture that's the reason that i have took so long to come with my lecture too because i have worked on this lecture i think around five to six days i've been working on this lecture so finally it's out and let's go what to focus on in this there are 10 uh, there are 12 areas that we are going to cover in this lecture the reason I have not divided this into part one, part two, part three is because when it comes onto the YouTube, and especially for the people who has not who have not been following my channel, they're not my regular subscriber, they don't watch, or if someone new comes to the channel, they don't know where is part one, where is part two. It's very you know, they don't know where which part to be watched first, which part to be watched later. Or which is important which is not because they think this part might be important that spine might not be important so that's the reason i don't want that uh, confusion so that's why everything is under because it's the same common topic right rather than putting it into three separate videos i thought put everything in one video even if this video will be a long video later on it might go up to two hours so but better to put everything in one so that it becomes very easy for the students that they need to focus only on one video if it's talking about ethics or anything it's just one video okay so that's the reason 12 areas we are going to cover starting with profession versus professionalism what is the meaning of profession you need to understand this before we go to ethics main point is ethics okay ethical stuff and all definitely you will get a question in SPL. there is no doubt 100 percent that's the reason this lecture is very important that's the reason i took so long uh, to to make a complete video on this ethics it's a very big uh, if you go through your SBL Kaplan textbook the latest one the latest version which is up to June 2022 this will be lecture 17 in your textbook lecture number 17 so please make it make a note somewhere if someone of you want to go back and check in that lecture you can go back because this is just that lecture this is just in a video form my explanation that's it many things I have not included in this which is there in your textbook many things i have included so it does not mean those things are not important i wanted to summarize it and make it in a short way some things are explained so much in detail which is not required understood that's the reason <clears throat> so profession versus professionalism what is the meaning of this too very important you should know what is profession because every profession has some ethical codes conduct and everything but before we go to ethics understand what is profession okay and mind you this lecture whatever it is whatever topics you are covering in this lecture 12 sec 12 uh, subtopics are there in this one video you don't have to memorize anything don't try to memorize what is ethics don't try to memorize what is public interest don't try to memorize what is profession nowhere in the exam they will ask you a definition for profession or a public interest no you just need to have a understanding brief understanding of each and every point that's it understand and go ahead and try to do a question obviously you cannot do a question because it's not a standalone question in sbl sbl is an integrated case study question you need to have a full understanding of all the sides of your syllabus to answer one sbl paper that's the reason i am not doing simultaneously any questions on sbl first i'll finish all the lectures on sbl that will be available under my sbl lecture the playlist the name of the playlist is sbl lecture you'll come and you will get everything starting with my first lecture even before that i had introduction to sbl so make sure that you watch it in order so that you understand it better okay so public interest is number two number three accounts accountants role and influence four corporate code of ethics fifth corporate and professional codes sixth professional code of ethics this looks similar they are not same corporate code of ethics is general generally ethics for anyone any business anything in the corporate world professional code of ethics is only for your profession for example which profession are we in we are accountant which body are we using professional body are we in under come on guys you must know it acca of course acca so that's why we are learning the 
professional code of ethics for ACCA, being an ACCA member, upcoming ACCA member. Okay. Conflict of interest and ethical threats. You should know what are the conflicts of interest. What are the ethical threats before you know the safeguard? Okay. Later we are coming to the safeguard. What are the safeguard to reduce those threat? Ethical dilemmas and conflict resolution. There might be so many ethical viewpoints you might be having. How to resolve it? Corruption and bribery. Yes. And ethical decision making. Wait. Sorry. Uh, ethical decision making and ethical behavior. The last one. Don't take this in. Uh, don't study this in an isolated form. That this topic, this this comes under. No, it's not like that. It's just divided into sub sub topics to have. So otherwise, if everything is under one, it becomes very difficult for students to absorb the knowledge. That's the reason it has been divided into 12 sections. When you go to your exam paper, you don't that 12 sections will not help you at all. Forget about the 12 sections. What is ethical? What is uh, corruption? No, just have an understanding. That's it. The lecture, the, the chapter is built up in this way. That's what I'm trying to explain you. So these are the 12 sections. OK. At the end of the video, I'm going to summarize everything, whatever we have covered. OK, since it's a long video, long span of time. So by the time we reached the last part, you must have forgot what is in the first part. Don't worry for that. The solution is we're going to summarize everything at the end. And before I start. This is just an intro what I'm going to cover in the video. Before I actually start the video, let me tell you one thing very important is. See ethical question in your ACCA paper, especially your professional papers. Whether it is SBR, whether it is uh, AAA, whether it is APM, AFM, ethical one ethics question you will get in any paper. Remember that. That's why this chapter is so, so, so important. So very important, no matter whatever paper you are attempting, not only for SBR. So when you are studying this uh, chapter, ethics, study it from a wide perspective, from all the angles, not just SBL. It's important for every paper. SPL is an introduction for the ethics. So you study ethics here. You don't have to study ethics elsewhere. You can use the same knowledge for your other papers also because one ethical question you will get no matter what, whether it is from your financial perspective, tax perspective, audit perspective, uh, whatever it is. OK, so that, keep that behind your mind. Now let us start. Now what I did, this is to aid you. This is for your uh, this is to make things simpler for you. So that you don't get confused in the slides. Where does the slide ends and where does the next topic starts? For that reason, this I have uh, done it by myself. Before the starting of every subtopic, I told you there are 12 subheadings, subsections, starting with professional versus professionalism. This is my number, first topic. I have made this chart. In this chart, this tells you the layout of what are the things I'm going to cover in that part only. Profession versus professionalism. That is the first topic. Under this, what I'm going to cover in the order. So that's why this chart is there. If before the starting of every chapter, you will see this chart. If this chart is there, means it's the starting of a new a new topic, new subtopic. Okay. So under this, the first topic is characteristics of a profession. We are going to cover that. Then second is how do you apply those characteristics to an accounting profession? We are specifically talking about accounting profession here. We are not touching about doctors, engineers. We don't we are not uh, touching all those other professions. OK, our main focus is on accounting profession being an SEC student. Professionalism is different from profession. It's again is a characteristics and under that uh, and after that we are going to cover accounting profession in detail. OK, accounting, just accounting profession and in accounting. Pro so these are the four areas we are going to cover and under accounting profession. There are two things we need to know. One is known as reactive approach. The other one is known as proactive approach. You can see it is labeled as four and four. It's not five. It's not a separate. It is under accounting profession only. So accounting profession can either take a reactive approach or proactive approach. What is the meaning of reactive and proactive? Briefly. Anyway, we are going to cover in detail, but just for short reactive means you react to something you react to a situation. After some certain things have occurred. Proactive means before that thing have actually occurred, you are taking action. You are taking preventive uh, measures and all. Right, that is the meaning of proactive. So reactive proactive. OK, let's start characteristics of a profession. What is a profession? Profession is made up of three things. 
three things has to be there for you to call it a profession see you can do any job okay not every job is counted as a profession understand that you can do any job for example i'm working at my home i'm cleaning my house can i tell that is a profession can i call it as a profession no profession has to have three things number one body of theory and skills it should have some skills some theories there for that whatever profession it is doctor is a profession accountant is a profession auditor is a profession because in all this field we have some technical knowledge some knowledge has to be you have to gain certain knowledge to uh, to practice to be an accountant you need the knowledge of accounts debit credit journal entries for a doctor you need to know certain things biology the medicine the human everything so theories and skills some skills some theory is there second some code of conduct is there for each profession there is some code of conduct you have to you have to uh, go by it and it's common okay it's common common values are there that acceptance of duty to society third one is very important because based on this we are going to talk about public interest later on the next topic acceptance of duty to society you have a duty towards a society you have to upheld that you are working for the public for the benefit of the public so if these three things are there then it's called a profession doctors let's take an example of one doctor for example doctor you need certain co courses certain qualifications to become a doctor some exams you have to give you have to do mbbs later code of conduct yes every doctor has certain code of conduct you have to go uh, you have to comply with if you go against by it you might be dismissed by the profession the board the body you might not you might not be able to practice that third acceptance of duty to society what is your duty you have a duty towards the society you have to take care of a patient being a doctor it's your duty yes obviously it's your job to take care you for money and all but other than that to a society you owe you owe a duty so three things you are a profession don't memorize it no that duty to society some code of conduct and some knowledge is there okay next now i'm going to explain this how this is applicable to accounting profession only for your understanding perspective to understand profession better only for that thing don't memorize this table it's not going to help in the exam it's not going to come also because in your exam some other profession might come there you might have to use a knowledge of profession to define whether it's a profession or not if it's a profession then blah 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 this this things that's why you need to know because profession might be different the given to you in the exam so now first characteristics was what oh, what was it theory of skills certain skills and theory has to be there if you see this from the accounting perspective yes we have some technical skill to be called as an accountant auditing skill is there all the standards that we studied under triple a audit accounting standards under sbr under financial reporting or ifrs ias this are the technical skills second we need some training and education some education is given to us from the college or self study whatever it is and some training we have to train practical experience requirement is required right some training has to be given to you without that training you cannot third examination system yes every profession has some examination system you call it an engineer accountant doctor okay that maintained continue maintained by continuing professional development yes we have this continuing professional development where you have to maintain that every year annually that you are professionally qualified what happens because knowledge see knowledge that you have gained 10 years back let's say will be outdated every year that's why you have to develop it continually you have to develop okay there is no full stop to that so acca make sure of all those things we have an examination we have cpd we have uh, some training required okay then moving to the next common code of values and conduct for accounting is what established by administrating body yes some body is there we have an acca body or cma or cpa right second maintains an objective outlook the reason for this code is it gives an objective outlook third ethical standards we have some ethical standards remember that is given under acca's code of ethics we are going to discuss this in section 6 that is the topic number 6 in your lecture we are going to come in, uh, come in detail for that code of ethics so this other things now duty to the society 
yes as a profession public trust you you are entitled to be trusted to act in the public interest you have to act in the public interest what is good for the public overall not for your own uh, selfish motives profession okay then in return members are granted a qualification and usage of the title in your name acc after you become a member it is not just you are doing for free you are not doing anything for free even if it's a duty to society you are giving the benefit to the society to the public public interest you are acting in the public interest in return what are you getting acc in front of your name you are being granted a qualification you are called an acc a member acc affiliate or a cpa whatever okay now professionalism so let's move our uh, attention towards professionalism profession is over now we went through three characteristics applied it to the accounting profession professionalism what, what does it mean it means you are acting professionally okay you are acting professionally that is the meaning of professionalism okay then it is it could be interpreted more as a state of a mind professionalism is more like a state of your mind than what you actually look like profession is see profit when you are into a profession you you are you you are given some rules that you have to follow obviously you will not be carrying the rule books everywhere okay no but you are bounded to follow some rules because now you are into a profession so profession meaning of profession is you have to follow some rules professionalism is up to you whether you 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 show it through your actions or not it's more like your state of mind okay so professional behavior imposes an obligation on members if you are into a profession you have to fall you have to abide uh, you have to comply with that you have to add you have to behave professionally because you have an obligation as a member of a certain body to go by the rules if you don't you are going to bring a discredit to your profession it's going to harm your profession if you are not acting professionally remember your profession is going to suffer people are not going to trust you as an auditor as an accountant next so professional behavior means you are complying with ethical standards it is more like ethics you are bringing professionalism means we are talking more in terms of ethics you can say profession is just by the rule you go professionalism is, is beyond the rules we have ethics also there whether it is ethical for me to do like this being an accountant or being an auditor or not if it's not don't do if it's yes okay <clears throat> now moving towards from professionalism we are moving towards accounting profession why this profession topic is profession but we are focused only on accounting profession okay the two approaches that they take over time they take see over the time in the beginning of the lecture i told you they take two approach the accountants reactive proactive over the year over the time period you can see accountants are taking more proactive than reactive approach okay simply so reactive is what if anything negative happens due to your accounting practices you take the responsibility it's just like simply you are saying you are surrendering to the situation you are surrendering yourself you are accepting the responsibility yes this is this thing has happened because it's my fault so now what are you doing you are trying to do something you are trying to change your practices to 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 remove the consequences that is known as reactive reacting to a situation reactive approach where is proactive no negative cons nothing negative happened but still you are seeking out and you want to contribute positively to the for the public interest okay let's illustrate this further reactive approach to understand better illustration means some from real life example let's take okay don't memorize this examples also just for understanding okay everyone of us must have heard about enron okay i am very sure none of you who is watching this video right now does not know what is enron or history about enron okay enron was a big company which has been you know accounting auditor they have done some frauds they have hidden something that they were hidden because of that 
now they are no more the company just couldn't survive it collapsed it was a big failure a massive failure because of this new rules have appeared right the servants oxley act in us was came up became effective after this collapse right what happened the accounting practice that they were doing in the enron enron is a company failed to identify the risk why because they had established uh, uh, some special purpose entities and why they have established it they are known to hide their debt debts could be hidden the debt the actual debt was not shown in the enron's main account that's the reason it the auditor couldn't catch they couldn't identify that's the reason it collapsed so accounting practice failed second so this may have contributed to the eventual downfall of enron and the loss of pensions due to many staff and non staff and then what happened because it collapsed they understood that this accounting practice is not valid anymore remove it so this practice was removed after that incident what happened later on later on they told that if there is any off balance sheet financing it has to be included in the balance sheet it should be shown in the main accounts of the company now it's a rule that's the reason there are some changes in what which standard if i ask you my my um, sbs students will know this better if you have given sbr before sbl what is it which standard i'm talking about leases yes exactly leases ifrs 16 leases they have changed now certainly off balance sheet financing you have to include some changes are there listen because of this and wrong yes it has impacted in so many places and in so many rules so many new rules came so many old rules were uh, they are not being they are removed okay now we are moving towards so in this sense we are saying they are reacting to a situation accounting profession next we are moving to proactive proactive what happens they are accounting profession understood the importance of what importance of environment importance of the the csr global social responsibility so they are now giving guidance on how to carry environmental audit even though nothing has nothing has been uh, taken place so that they have to come up with environmental audit by force no they themselves thought it's very important that's why they are giving guidance on how to carry this environmental audit okay they are giving guidance on what are the appropriate metrics that are needed for to carry environmental audit which is currently not there okay but accounting profession is doing it they are working for that second guidance is provided in the public interest as a benefit to society rather than waiting until society as a whole request the guidance so guidance means what you thought that this is good for the benefit this will be beneficial to the society let me give it not that the society is demanding from you or they want it that's why you are giving the guidance so don't wait until the society demands you that please give me a guidance on the area you give that guidance before the actual demand it's like before something becomes a necessity you provide it if it is in the if it is beneficial for the society and if you think it's for the public interest okay that is the whole idea of proactive approach with the public interest right so next topic is from that only okay so from the last topic we end in the proactive approach from there we are moving towards public interest now i've told you this is a new lecture new topic that's why this chart will come after every new topic this chart only will come so first we are going to cover what is public interest second we are going to cover the public interest and the comp companies third accountants and the public interest and fourth uh, responsible leadership it's a new thing not covered in earlier it's not there in the earlier textbook so far i remember so responsible leadership is a new thing okay four areas so first what is public interest <clears throat> see pub, the distinguish mark of a profession is what i've told you in the earlier uh, topic also in earlier slides public interest profession means it has to be uh, it is an acceptance of a responsibility to the public 
as a profession you have a responsibility to the society that is the that is the one thing that distinguishes you as a profession what is the meaning of public interest of so public interest means it is benefiting the society as a whole it is not just the individual members of the society who are getting the benefit overall everyone is getting now many people don't understand this they think there are 100 people all the 100 people will be benefited that is the meaning of benefiting the society public interest no it's not the meaning majority of it of the society of the public are satisfied are happy they are served that is the meaning of public interest it's not possible that you are serving all the groups of of a community will be satisfied no there will be some minority who will not be okay it might not be for their interest but we are talking public interest means uh, based on the majority majority of the public the society it's beneficial for them then you should carry on obviously if, if you are making a decision let's say to build a road 80 percent of the population are okay with it it's for the public interest you go ahead with it even if 20 percent say it's not maybe for individual needs it might not be okay for them so you are going to work on based on the 80 percent that is the meaning of public interest society as a whole okay second accountancy profession public includes you need to know as an accounting profession who are your public if you don't know who are your public how can you serve the interest so who are the public don't memorize again i'm telling you repeating you several times don't memorize these things this is not going to help in the actual exam understand the main concept the main theme that i'm trying to create from here that's it you understand this you'll be able to write any answers in sbr if you know what is public interest so publics are clients your client for whom you are making the financial reports your credit providers governments employees employers and investors this are some list okay now public interest and companies okay so in a company how are we going to take care of it the actions of a majority of the shareholders may affect the minority so in a company how can you held the, pub, uh, the the public interest how can you take care of a public interest the meaning in a in a company if you are taking an action that is going to affect the minority shareholders okay let's say seven uh, majority of the shareholders 70 percent of the shareholders are taking some action that is going to affect very badly the 30 percent of the shareholders what's going to happen so in this case how are you going to keep the public interest in a company it is it comes as in a form of rights there is no uh, I think known as protection of minority rights the minority shareholder they should be given some rights so that they can practice they can make use of that is known as protection of minority rights okay this 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 is not always required only required in certain conditions where they think they are not they are being affected they are not being treated rightly so there they will be protected by this right okay because minority shareholders what happens sometimes they might be uh, they might be denied certain rights such as they might not be given the uh, access to dividend which is given to majority shareholders or they might be told that they you cannot take part in decision making process in this condition you can give them this right the minor majority uh, sorry minority rights so if you are doing this what are you doing you are taking care of your public public interest just now i told you public interest is majority yes but if it's affecting the minority shareholders okay it should not affect some party over another if one group is affect, benefiting only the other one is not benefiting at all and it's not ethical also it's it's not reasonable also it does not make sense it's not reasonable then public interest you have to take care you have to think from the point of public interest you have to protect your minority shareholders if there is a thing that you can protect the minority shareholders you have to take an action if there is a if there are resources if there are tools that could be used if there is no then you need to work on it but here in a company from the point of a company yes you have this protection of minority rights you can take use of it you are practicing public interest here okay another point from another angle if you want to think public interest action of organizations can affect society sometimes for example pollution 
or you are treating your labor force very poorly in this case how the public interest will be uh, practiced how you are, you can benefit the public the government has to come into the action now because for the for whom government is doing this for you or me no for the public interest for the public interest so the government will now come and decide they will limit the action of the organizations why because it will be for a greater good of the society as a whole that's why government has to come and do it now public interest and accountants we were talking about from the point of a company if company affects the organization or majority affects minority that time how public interest is held now we are moving towards accountants how accountants will practice public interest accountants see accountants normally they don't go against the public interest because in their head also in their aim is also to protect the public interest they should be benefited generally normally okay a reasonable accountant they will not go against the public interest but sometimes it happens that they do go maybe for their own self interest or whatever it is but most of the time this is our assumption that they don't so ethical code is applicable to most accountants confirms that such action is not normally appropriate that's why we have ethical codes next we are moving towards that also okay that will be the next uh, topic ethical code and all but for now understand why ethical code came ethical code came so that public interest could be uh, so that we uh, accountants can act in the public interest because as a profession we told in the beginning public interest has to be held there should be public interest that's why ethical code is there which any accountant it does not matter which country where you have given the accountant exam you are an accountant you have to go by the ethical code any accountants you have to because if you are going by the ethical code it confirms that you are working for the public interest that's what it implies okay in some situations lack of disclosure may be against the public interest yes sometimes what happens is certain situations certain things you need to disclose to the public if you don't it might not be good for the public in that condition it is said as you are going against the public interest not every situation but some situation yes you if you are not disclosing lack of disclosure against public interest in other situations if you disclose certain things it will be against the public interest you have to be very careful of what you disclose and when you have to disclose when you have to disclose certain thing always you have to think whether it will be good for the public or not sometimes disclosing is bad sometimes not disclosing is bad because sometimes some information needs to be kept confidential so that the society is not harmed at large now we are moving towards the last topic under public interest is responsible leadership leadership responsible leadership leadership was my first lecture i covered go back and check this is responsible leadership because we are taking care of the public a bigger a greater portion of a society so that means leaders has to be responsible now put it in that way if you want to understand it better okay now their responsibility increased now nowadays i'm talking about this every stakeholder no it's not just like old days where the shareholders or the managers know what is in the business and none from the outside is interested now they want to know now all the all form of stakeholders wants to know how you are working for the society as a, as a business mostly ngos will be very interested they desire they want to know the business conduct how you are conducting your business what how it is going to affect socially or environmentally how is going to affect your decisions how is going to affect the society at large because they want all the business leaders to take responsible decisions which is good socially and ecologically that's why this responsible leadership came into the picture because all the stakeholders now wants to know not just how well the you are they also wants to know how you are conducting your business ethically legally is it right okay so in a very basic sense if you want to understand responsible leadership definition is what management of business entities interactions with society you manage how a business is going to interact with the society when you are interacting with a society you have to address various concerns of the stakeholder group there are so many stakeholder group not just one 
because all the stakeholder together they contribute to the multiple bottom line what are the multiple bottom line three things or you can say triple bottom line which is very important so economic social environmental performance economic is your it is known as three p's i would say what is economic known as profit social social people and environmental planet exactly profit people planet so some action if you are taking any action if a business leaders are taking it has to benefit you economically that means you have to earn profit from it number one number two people the people has to get benefit the 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 employees are treated fairly the the managers are treated fairly the shareholders are given fair uh, dividends reasonable and finally environment planet no so no pollution your environment has to be protected so all these three things together it goes that is the meaning of responsible leadership now there are some qualities that you need that any responsible leadership needs what are those don't memorize again i'm telling you but know it number one any responsible leadership they they have to have the ability to make informed ethical judgments whether something is ethical for me to do or not even if it's legally available let's say alcohol is made legally available in your whatever the region you are but does it mean that it's ethically also right or should i take it because it's now legal a responsible leader should be able to make that decision for himself next discourage moral courage and aspire to positive change sorry displaying a moral courage uh, courage <clears throat> they are very courageous they display that also morally okay they are very, they stick to their moral no matter what is the circumstances because they think they can bring positive change through their moral courage third they are forward looking they don't look backward tomorrow how can i benefit the society overall their thinking is always forward not what i have done or what bad has happened no fourth long term thinking and and in perspective taking they see many perspective before they take a decision and it's always long term if i'm taking a decision today whether it's going to benefit, uh, affect long in long term how is it going to affect my planet the environment my people they always think all those things communicates effectively with stakeholders they are always they are a very good communicator by the way any leaders should be a good communicator but a responsible leadership you have to be you have to take that as an initiative that you have to communicate on a regular basis with your all your stakeholders participative in collective problem solving they collectively solve a problem so all this are some qualities of a responsible leadership now we are moving to test your understand test your understanding number 1 before we go to our third topic test your understanding one so here we have supposed to provide examples of two situations number one where disclosure information is for the public interest number two where lack of disclosure is for the interest of public interest that means if you don't disclose is good for the public so let's see the answer there are three situations where when you disclose it's good for the public interest number one for example like criminal okay they will continue to do crime if you do not disclose information about them okay such as money laundering okay so here you need to disclose to the public for the public interest number 2 second is where it will decrease the accountability you need to disclose one example is enron right they are illegal actions so illegal actions of companies needs to be disclosed otherwise they will keep on doing it for a long term and it will affect the stakeholders and number 3 is where it will impair the health and the safety of the public you need to disclose for example what is the contamination of the of of a land by an organization this information the pollution level needs to be disclosed 
because it's going to affect the health and the safety of the public. If you do not disclose, it's going to be against the public interest. Now coming to part B, where lack of disclosure is in the public interest. That means you do not disclose and you don't have to, you don't have to disclose. For example, price sensitive information. You don't have to give it. Okay, like share price or the what are the interest rate movements details is not required because this can harm the business okay and if you disclose this it's going to harm the public interest rather than benefit so you have to take care of that where lack of disclosure is required and where disclosure is required for the public interest Now the third section of the lecture is accountants role and influence. Number one, influence on organization. What influence does accountants have on organization? Then we are going to cover influence on society, the accountants influence on society and accountants influence on distribution of power and wealth. So these are the three areas where they have influence, organization, society and distribution of power and wealth. So this is just the explanation of that chart. How an accountant has influence on organization through their services, the services that they give. Influence in society because they act in the public interest. And how do they distribute the power and wealth? By uh, their use of specialized skills. Now, influence on organization is the first. How do they influence organization? Because accountancy profession is very significant, it's potentially the most significant profession that has an influence on organization, right? Every organization you see nowadays need at least one accountant. No organization survive, survives without an accountant. So you see accounting profession is there everywhere. All the organizations throughout the world has an accountant profession. Then why? Is accountant so important? If I ask you this question, what would you answer me? Because accountants, they provide a range of services, not just one, not just two, range. For example, financial accounting, audit, management accounting, taxation advice, and consultancy. You see? That's why we have auditor everywhere. We need a tax advisor. We need consultant. We need financial accountant. And who does who provides all the services? The accountants. Accountants. Now, we know that they have a very significant influence on an organization. But we also know that there are some limitations to that influence. That means they cannot influence up to that great extent. There are some limitations why they cannot influence that much. Number one, the extent of organizational reporting, especially when an organization is in financial difficulty. Okay, we are going to explain these points in detail later, this bullet points. Just know the list of the limitations. Second, because they have a conflicts of interest when they are giving additional services. Long term relationship with clients, overall size of accountancy firms, focus on growth and profit. So, these are the five limitations why auditors can, accountants cannot influence. It limits their influence. So, the first one is the number point. Okay, so next paragraph, sorry, the next slide is the explanation of those five points. That means we'll be having around five to six more slides just for the explanation of these points. First one is auditing organizations in difficulties. When an organization is in difficulty, let's see what happens. Auditor, what does auditor do? Auditor needs to ensure that they do not show too favorable a picture of organization. Auditor have to make sure of that. Especially when it's in a, uh, when the organization is in financial difficulty. Why? Because when someone is in financial difficulty and if you are showing that they are making a profit or they are in a favorable picture of an organization, okay, it is considered that, that there is some something there, something hidden. Right? 
it makes your organization uh, looks more doubtful because it's in a it's in the time of the financial difficulty so account auditor has to make sure that they do not show too favorable picture of the organization at that time financial difficulty so because of this what happens auditor cannot auditor cannot do what they want even though they have this influence they still cannot show that influence why because of the financial difficulty next so if auditor if they report adversely on this account what happens it will push the organization into insolvency it can not all the organization goes into insolvency but it can towards at so but if you keep quiet about the difficulties also the auditor what happens and later on if uh, event occurred that a company went into insolvency or anything like that who is going to be criticized the most auditor the auditor who gets criticized the most if if they know that there are difficulties and they are keeping quiet about it so it's in the both both the hand whether they show a favorable picture or they don't show a favorable picture it is the auditor so in this condition you see they cannot influence they cannot influence they have to go according to the 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 they have to react according to the situation they have to report according to the situation so they cannot influence other clients may lose confidence and they might change the auditors if the auditor reports adversely on a company so who is influencing the auditor or the organization the organization in this condition is now having an influence on the auditor because they are now forced that you cannot report adversely on us if you do we are going to change you we are going to change you so deciding whether you have to report or not or you have to show them in a favorable picture or not is very important and is very difficult in practice what should be your appropriate report the auditor's report should it be qualified should it be uh, modified unmodified what qualified adverse or what very difficult it involves a judgment of the auditor by the way that's why auditors are said to be one of the most challenging uh, job that anyone can ever take because so much of your judgment is involved in that it's not an objective kind of uh, nature of job it's very subjective auditors need to use their judgments very highly why based on what they have to judge based on what one on one hand they have a public interest to the society the auditor that means they have to report fairly what it is actually that means if they are facing a problem they have to show unfavorable right because they have a public of interest but on the other hand they are forced to not do that why because they might be kicked out by their client so in this two condition they have to judge what is the appropriate uh, report that they have to come up with okay next point we discussed is selling of additional services okay see it is very common okay and it makes logical sense also that accountant is the one who is giving this additional services why because accountant is the one who has uh, the overall knowledge about the company about the client who knows most about the client in an organization is the accountant accountant so accountant is in a good position in an excellent position to give this additional services if he can give accountant services he can give other services also beyond accounting okay then so when you provide additional services what happens if you give additional services you okay you are not being independent anymore the independence of the auditor is being criticized here why because then accountant firm is becoming too familiar too dependent on the organization in terms of fees because they know most of the auditor knows that it's not through auditing it is through the additional of this Uh, sorry selling of this additional services through which they earn a huge amount of fee right that's why that's the reason they want to give this additional services auditor but this makes the auditor very dependent on the organization if the organization says if they lose out this client they are going to lose a huge amount of fee through this additional services that's why they are very dependent on the organization they are not independent anymore example as author addison who is the auditor of enron right who is no longer uh, allowed to practice auditing now because of what happened in enron 
because he was too dependent on anyone. In terms of society, what is it? Even in terms of society, if you think overall, generally, auditor giving this additional services is very cost beneficial. It's good because it's less cost if the auditor gives it this additional service rather than hiring someone else to give this additional services to you. Okay. But because there's a lack of independence, because auditor becomes too familiar with the organization, it's good. And it's very important that someone else, another firm gives this additional services. Right. Third, relationship with clients. How this can limit your influence. Any firm or any organization Okay, they always prefer long term relationships over short term. Why? Because this, this is very helpful in terms of saving time so that second time when you're auditing this company, you don't have to again go through and understand the environment of the client. You already know it in the first time initial through your initial uh, gathering of knowledge about the client. You know it. You're familiar. You know it. The cost is reduced overall. That's the reason long term relationships are more favored. Okay. And also it is said that if you are having a long term relationships, okay, you are just dealing with few numbers of auditors who knows your confidential information. You are not passing this confidential information to just randomly any number of auditors. Not every year you are giving it to new new auditors. That's why also it's good. But what happens again? Same like before. They become very familiar with the organization. That means they are losing their independence. Auditor is losing their independence. Okay. When they lose their independence, what happens? It becomes very hard for them to make an objective decision. What is the appropriate report? On what report to give? So in this condition, what's happening? Check from the point of public interest because topic is public interest. Whether it is being served or not, it is not served. If this long term management is there, you are not going to serve the public. Because you will become familiar and you are going to advocate. You are going to say what your client wants you to say. So you are not serving the public interest in this case. You are not giving the true objective picture of the client. So because of this, many countries limit the length of the time that audit partner can provide services to a specific client. That means if you are giving your client is A, let's say name of a client is Mr. A. You can only give him the services, whether audit, whether additional. We are talking in terms of audit here. Okay. Five years in US, up to five years, you can be the same auditor for that company for client A. Beyond five years, you cannot, you have to change. They have to change the audit or you cannot practice being an auditor for that. Five years in US and seven years in UK. Okay, you don't have to worry too much about the time difference that two years. That's okay. You don't have to memorize just for your understanding that what could be the length of the time. So every country has different length of time. Okay, some has five, some has seven, some has three. It does not matter, but then what matters is there is a specific length of time beyond that which you cannot be a audit partner for a specific client. You have to change your client. Okay. Why are they doing this? Why are they changing the audit partner to mitigate the risk so that your independence is not being uh, your independence is there. You're holding up to your independence. You're not losing your independence. That's the reason. Both size of accountancy firm can also limit the influence. See costs are reduced. Okay, when your accountancy firm is very big, you can easily provide training uh, training to your staff. Cost will not be so high, it will reduce. Higher the organization, lower will be the cost in terms of training your staff. Okay, and standardizing or audit procedures also. For big organizations, it's very easy. But for small, the more staff is there, the more you have to train, the cost will go up. But for the big, large, huge firm, it's less. Okay. But on the other hand, large firms have some disadvantages also. They are going to lose out on personal service, one to one service. A personal service, if they want to give, they cannot give because they are very big, so many clients. So that personal service, they will lose out. Okay. And because of this, what happens? Actual quality of service goes down. You become more distance from your client. There will be so many layers of people. And what happens because of that? 
but it's very important you cannot say that because of this things uh, better to have small no large firms are very important in auditing why because only this firms can audit the large multinational companies they have the resources they have the skills they have the people only they can do that's why you see all these large multinational companies they are audited by whom the big four companies ey deloitte right all this so in this case also accountant is not able to influence it is the size and competition big four auditing firms they are very competitive okay because all of them believe that if they try to cut cost they can get the market share from each other but this will not work in the public interest because if you are trying to cut down your cost remember your standard of audit will uh, suffer it's not even in the interest of the audit firms also to give poor audit services why because if you try to do that you are penalized you have you are going to suffer some legal action against the audit if that happens so in this case also you cannot influence you have to give a good quality service it is not the auditor who decides that i can give low quality service and can get around with it no you have to give high quality so you are not influencing but you are forced by the nature that you have to give good quality services so influence is being diminished it's reduced you see all those five factors is diminishing it now we are moving towards influence in society the five points we covered how they influence an organization through their services that means they cannot have a say over their services whether they are going to give a low quality service whether they are going to give a high quality service whom they are going to serve whom they are not going to what type of service they, all this are decided by the event based on the circumstances based on the consequences that they have to face there they do not have an influence now we are moving to a society in terms of society accounting profession is a profession which is uh, very accountable you are accountable to someone you just cannot get around with it you do some mistakes or some fraud in accounts or you show some incorrect uh, amounts you just cannot get along with it you are accountable to someone okay so that is that profession and it is seen at least by accountants as being able to act in the public interest at least what does it mean there are so many professions nowadays but if you consider if you compare all the professions out of all the professions at least accountants they are seen to act in the public interest if not other professions can compromise okay a doctor if he does not treat a patient or if if he gives him an incorrect medicine he is not acting in the public interest it's possible there are so many cases like that that it has been done but that's okay why because if a doctor does it it's only affecting the single doctor it's not no one is going to lose trust on all the doctors they are going to go to some other doctor alternative is there but if an accountant does it it's going to affect the profession not just a single they will not see that he is an accountant he has done it the whole accountant as a profession reputation will go down because they are under a body acca or cma or cpa whatever it is and accountants they don't try they always try to act in the public interest very very less you will see them acting against public interest so up to now accountant has a good name good reputation good social standing you see why because they are said that they are acting in the public interest up to now and i and i hope that uh, you know when we become a acca member we'll also keep that good name okay so even though they have the profession has the skills and the knowledge okay it may not be trusted fully due to past failing even if you as an accountant today being an acca member you are fully qualified you have all the knowledge okay still you will not be trusted because of the past failing what they have done in the author addison still accountants are seen with a doubtful eyes but for doctor for engineer that's not the thing or for any other profession that's not the case because accountant are treated as one body if one accountant does somewhere in some country some mistake 
it will affect the whole accounting profession everywhere globally throughout the world that's why accountant has to be very very extra careful very very careful now barriers exist with accountancy profession that lead this accountants to avoid change and maintaining the status quo see there are some barriers accountants they normally don't want to change what they have been practicing for years if they are following a certain rule they want to stick to that rule and they don't want to change because there are some reasons why they do let's go through those reasons next slide but the accountancy profession does have the knowledge to become involved in initiatives it does not mean that if they cannot change the rule of or if they cannot they do not get involved in new initiative they cannot they yes they can they can get involved in new initiative it's just that they are, they are too scared or they don't want to that's it it's just that they don't want to but they can it's not that they cannot so let's see uh wait before that let's see why how they can get involved in new initiative or are they being involved an example of new public interest work is what csr reporting csr reporting is for whom is it for the company is it for the auditor no it's for the public for the society because it is for their interest that now the accounting profession has come up with what csr reporting corporate social responsibility reporting earlier it was not there now it's becoming it will become compulsory also mandatory also soon in future maybe in 4 to 5 years now why accountants enjoy the status quo that means why they don't want to change this are some points number 1 nature of accounting itself if you see accountant accountant is what accountant is said to be following the rule they don't make rules they follow the rules they are followers of rules they are not makers of the rule next and by the way you don't have to memorize this set of list okay it's not important understand why accountants do not want to change second accountants are very busy people if you see in any organization the most busiest is accountant it is not the marketing manager it is not the uh, what do i say mm. the human resource it is the accountant who's the most busiest in any organization whether big or whether small obviously big ones more it will be more busy that's why they don't have so much of time to get involved in new areas okay third accountants are employed by organizations what does it mean because they are employed by organization they believe that they have a they only have a duty towards the shareholder of an organization or the one who have employed them so they don't want to change they don't change fourth they enjoy a reputation of being impartial accountants are said to be impartial they are not partial towards any group they are very impartial but if they get involved in any new initiative they might be impartial if they don't like certain things they might say let's not change and if they like certain thing they will say persuade to change so they are becoming impartial now a minority of accountants are responsible okay there are not so many of accountants who are responsible for this enron case whatever happened with enron it's only just a minority of accountants who were responsible for it but what happens even though minority of accountants was there but when the blame game comes blame who has done it who is responsible the whole profession has to suffer remember that means trust on accountancy is going down day by day okay because those days when enron during enron time there were no such thing as ethical standard for accountants or anything like that that time it was not there now only they have built up all those ethical standards and everything okay so now we are moving towards influence on power and wealth distribution how do they influence this is the third uh, thing we have covered under influence on organization influence on society third is influence on power and wealth distribution accountants remember they have specialized skills and knowledge okay they have a very public sorry specialized skills and knowledge which they can use in the public interest they could be a tax advisor they could be an auditor they could be a consultant or financial manager anything they have the skills and knowledge which is for the public only so society may have an objective of obtaining a more equal distribution of power and wealth what does society generally wants 
in a society you go they always want the equal distribution of power and wealth that means they want everyone to be equally wealthy and equally everyone should have power in a society not just one is very rich one is very low, uh, poor not like that that is objective of a society any society so based on the abilities that an accountant has okay accountants can advise who can advise accountants can advise how this power and wealth can be distributed among the the population because they have the skills they have the knowledge so they are more they are in a better position to advise on how power and wealth has to be distributed so let's see how they can influence the accountants number 1 ensure that organizations comply with the legislation what what is the legislation says that they disclose that they disclose what is the payment of the director the executive director's payment disclose it why because when it is disclosed directors are not directors cannot manipulate anything in their account okay they cannot pay themselves huge bonuses and large incentives which is against the public interest they cannot do that if it is uh, disclosed already because if they do then public is going to react very unfavorably unfavorably uh, towards them that's why disclose so through this uh, by doing by disclosing the director's uh, uh, remuneration what happens the level of the package and each uh, director how much they are getting and all if it is disclosed how it's going to affect that means directors okay directors are said to be what they are very wealthy the executive directors in an organization they are very very wealthy they are very rich because they are able to give themselves huge bonuses and incentives if it is not disclosed no one is able to tell that he is uh, how much he is owning or how much but if it is disclosed everyone knows they cannot give themselves huge bonuses that means rich does not become richer and poor does not become poor almost they will get in that range only what is an appropriate range that director should get in any organization so the wealth is not being given to the directors you see it is only given up to a limit so in that way you can bring the directors into more or less an equal term towards the other stakeholders they have their salaries or fees or whatever advising the government on different tax regime what does it mean rather than making an equal tax for everyone rich or poor make it different based on the income that means on low salary low tax high salary high tax because if you are giving the same income or tax for any range of salary whether rich or poor for rich is okay but what about the poor they will become more poor right so based on the tax change the tax laws now advice on the content of the company ad so first we talked about organization disclose remuneration second government advise them who is advising government accountant to on different tax regime third content of the company ad one example is in uk where a new ad contains provision for protection of creditors and employees there is a new rule there is a new ad in uk it's not international it's in uk only where there is a provision that it says provision in the company's ad 2006 which says protection of creditors and employees that means your creditors and your employees needs to be protected so through this you are bringing employees creditors the other stakeholders of the society in an equal term okay one example is whistle blowing on illegal actions of company officials yes there should be a whistle blowing in practice in 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 place so that if any illegal actions right is there you can immediately complain so that rich does not become rich through illegal means poor does not become poor that's how you distribute the power and the wealth or the powerful people does not become so powerful 
by doing all illegal actions. That's why whistle blowing, if you keep in place, they will not be able to practice it. Okay, now accountants able to influence the distribution of power and wealth in society in following ways. How can they influence? This one was okay. Oh, yeah, it's uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, this list is not over yet. A set of accounts. If you give a set of accounts, which provides information about the shareholder on the performance of the company. It's easy for you to understand. How? Because it says how rich your shareholders are. Right? So, accountants and auditors, what do they do? They serve capitalists. That means they serve shareholders. Their main job is to serve shareholders, whether auditor, whether accountant. So, that's why they can simply check the accounts that follow the appropriate rules or not. They can follow, they can check the rules. Then accountants working within business. They can support capitalism in numerous ways. For example, finance director. Finance director is what? An accountant only, right? They can provide advice on how to increase profit margins. Through this, you are controlling the wealth. Now, you understanding? You are advising on how to increase the profit margin. Or internal auditor. They can put uh, controls to reduce the cost. To make cost more efficient through this we are talking in terms of wealth how wealth can be distributed to the shareholder through accountant through his advice so that's it for accountants roles and influence now let's move on to our fourth topic which is corporate code of ethics this are general ethics for any business it's corporate it's not for acc only or this accountant profession so this in this we are going to cover various things as you can see the list is big first purpose and values of business second employees when we are talking about code of ethics ethics is applicable to any stakeholders that's why employees customers shareholders or the fund the share uh, sorry the debt holders suppliers society and how do you implement this ethics before you implement, know the purpose and value of the business, right? So what is corporate code of ethics? First understand it. That means you are applying ethical values to your business behavior. Your business behavior is what it's ruled by your ethical values. That is the meaning of corporate code of ethics. Ethics could be anything. It could be personal ethics, professional ethics, right? We are talking ethics in terms of business, corporate. So this ethics can help you. It comes in various forms okay it could range from broad strategies to how companies negotiate with their supplier the way you negotiate with your supplier ethics is very important here the way you uh, carry on with your strategies how do you uh, make uh, come to the strategy or how do you make a strategy ethical values matters a lot based on your ethical values you're going to make a strategy then it goes beyond legal requirements it is beyond legal. It is not just that because law says you are going to be ethical. No. Beyond that, many companies, they provide what? They provide the detail of their ethical approach. How ethical they are. In what? In their CSR report. Corporate and Social Responsibility Report. Now, look at this diagram. This was the stakeholders that a corporate code of ethics includes all these things employee, supplier, customer, shareholder. Purpose and value of business is very important. Society and implement. And how do you implement this corporate code of ethics? Okay, I'm not going to take so much of time here because that's not so important that how corporate of code of ethics is applied or what it is included. So quickly I can go through this. Okay, because these things are very easy, pretty easy to understand. So purpose and value of business, number one. In this section, it tells you the reason why organization is there, why it exists. If you see any organization, let's take Starbucks, for example, go to Google, check out the mission statement or the purpose and the value of Starbucks. You will check. There will be three, four bullet points. The list will be there. We strive or we exist for this, this reasons. Okay. Next mission statement. Mission statement of any company, go and check. Key areas are there in that mission statement then what are the things that are usually included in any mission statement today go to google check any company one example is starbucks 
you can take another company check their mission statement and in this mission statement check whether these things are there or not number one product or services what product or services they are giving for example for me if i have to make a mission statement for what i'm doing what am i doing i'm teaching i am giving the education knowledge so my mission statement will be something in terms of that i want to give the best knowledge or highest level of education so something like that would be my mission statement if i have to write financial objective of the company go and check a real mission statement and check whether these things are there or not okay number one which product or service they are giving second financial objective for example they want to increase by five percent or financial objective means some numbers will be there they want to increase the by 10 percent 5 percent every year what is it anything role of the business and society as seen by the company itself how are they going to benefit the society the community local community or whatever something like that will be written in the mission statement we serve to we aim to serve the local community like this like this blah blah now moving to employees quickly i can go through this it will not take should not take more than two minutes i think see there must be information on how business relates to their employees okay any corporate of code of ethics should have these things employees they should take into picture numbers two employees have rights they are not just a tool for making your goods and services that's why company should have policies on this as well the employees what are the policies that they can have for example what would be their working condition it has to be good how are they recruiting the recruitment should be fair okay they are investing on their development and training they should be given the rewards appropriate rewards their health should be taken care of health and safety equal opportunities no gender discrimination these are all policies if you see there if you read the policies of a company you will see all those things there are no gender discrimination we hire both gender based on their merits okay we are not discriminating an employee based on their race gender color ethnicity or whatever retirement policies there how they are going to be made redundant okay how they are going to use the company assets okay all these things are there go and check check a real to have a better understanding because this is just a not theory part okay customer what do a company wants company has a responsibility that they have to make a good or service up to a standard good standard with the reasonable price for customer okay but that does not mean that they should not make profit obviously company should think about profit as well keeping some portion of profit as well then at reasonable price and good quality okay so customers have customer faith in the company and its products must be established and build up over time okay over the time you have to build up that faith of customer in you you just cannot hire a customer today and leave them and forget about them and no no so what are the key areas for the company to invest based on the customer from the customer's point of view it is a product quality they will always talk this in their corporate core of ethics we take care of the product quality because customers care about the product quality the most the most factor is product quality if you look at any product why do you buy a certain type of brand or certain type of product if i ask you this question why is it because you like the color is it because you like the packaging is it because uh, you like the the staff who is giving it to you the services the after sale service no the number all this are okay number one is product quality because it's durable durability is there it's the, the features of the product might be very attractive quality so because of this number two fair pricing pricing is the next important if you are a person who gives a value to quality over the price quality should be a number one important reason and second is fair pricing pricing has to be fair number three after sale service if you if the product breaks if anything happens for example now you buy apple or samsung phone what do they want the quality has to be good the price has to be reasonable and they are after sales service if it breaks or anything happens to it they want after sales service shareholders now let us go to the shareholders see shareholders are investors that's why it's obvious they want a return a proper return so because of that company has to invest on what or have they commit 
that shareholders get a proper return on their investment then they have to give the timely the correct information to the shareholder what are the historical achievements what are their future prospect and they will be involved maybe up to a greater or a lesser extent in the decision making process the shareholders okay under the principles of good corporate governance shareholders whether more or less they are involved in decision making process remember that they are not away from the company it's not just that they see and that they run away or get out of no they make decisions whether they make more or less that's another thing that's not very important what's important is yes they do make a decision but they when they make a decision for a company it is under the principles of good corporate governance what does it mean all the principles of good corporate governance they follow for example information has to be transparent there should be appropriate boards there should be appropriate non executive director sitting on the board all those things they take care of suppliers okay what do they do suppliers are the one who provides good quality services to the company over a time right most important is what the most important is that they should supply this at the right amount of time so what does the company normally do they attempt to settle invoices promptly okay number 2 they have to cooperate with the supplier so that relationship is maintained and it also improves the quality of inputs you have to cooperate and maintain this relationship with supplier or tell them that quality matters to you therefore it needs to be improved or maintained you should not use any bribery you should not give or you should not accept also for securing the contract with supplier you should not do that because if you do that then it cannot come under corporate code of ethics you are following ethics no you have to be ethical you cannot accept bribe for that also there is a separate section section 10 corruption and bribery okay next when you are selecting supplier you have to have it has to be based on some ethical criteria such as you support suppliers who are involved in fair trade or they are not using child labor in their manufacture something like that okay now all this if you see one good example is starbucks because starbucks use uh, the farmers and all for the coffee bean from the various parts of the world you can see whether they use child labor or not you will see in their mission statement or, or in the corporate code of ethics for a starbucks that they say we don't use child labor or the labors are treated fairly we use fair trade principles all those things will be there listed in that that's why i always tell you go and check a real corporate code of ethics from a real business okay it could be any uh, thing now society how do they maintain relationship with the society csr report companies produce csr report because they want to give they want to communicate how they give to the society through how are they going to communicate through what csr report these are the features that will be there okay and the csr report how it complies with the law that means the company what are their obligations that they have to protect how are they involved in the local affair maybe a specific staff is there or not what are their policy on donations how do they donate to education and charitable institutions so all these things are there next the last stage is implementation after everything is set up how they are following the code of ethics for supplier customer everything how implementation is very important without implementation nothing goes forward okay it's absolutely good that you have a great corporate code a set of ethics for your supplier customer or employee anything but if it's not implemented it is of no use okay so implementation the process by which code is finally issued and then used you issue this and then you use that code you actually start following those codes if you say you are not going to accept child labor make sure that you are not involved with any supplier who are involved in child labor it is very easy for you to then reject that supplier from the list okay but when you implement you have to review also every year you have to see whether this code 
needs to be changed or is it being followed or not because it's very important that it has to be updated based on the current time maybe code of ethics you have made when you have first started your business your organization but after 5 years after 3 years it might not be relevant you might have to uh, change certain features certain things certain code you have to do it that's why you have to review every year annually it has to be reviewed and updated code of ethics never remains fixed forever changes okay now fifth topic is corporate and professional codes okay so here we are going to study what are the benefits of a code drawbacks of a code and effectiveness of the code how a code is very effective okay for this we have various if you see open your textbook chapter 17 kaplan textbook okay now i'm not talking about bbp uh, various uh, laws are there legislations are there rules are there codes are there i didn't cover this in this video because i felt it's not important to for to know the history of all the codes and all because it it's not applicable for the exam and is just for understanding so for your understanding you can go and read in the textbook if you want if you have an interest to read otherwise it's not so important so i have just included benefit drawbacks and the effectiveness of the code one benefit is if in terms of conflict it provides a framework you can solve conflict easily if you have a code through that code you can solve many things second it's like a guideline if a similar ethical dispute happens it's a guideline by seeing it by reviewing it you can see how you have to react third boundaries it is like a boundary if you go beyond this okay it might be incorrect or it might be correct something like that ethically incorrect okay that means this is a boundary beyond this you cannot pass if you pass you are ethically you are unethical it's easy to say beyond this is unethical if it's not beyond that it's ethical right disadvantage it is just a code you can have any code corporate code ethical code it's just a code but maybe for your specific ethical issue that code might not be suitable second code code is one but by two different person it can be interpreted in a two different ways that means for both the person whatever they are doing might be ethical for them it might appear to be ethical for them at least even though it's not ethical or not that's a different thing okay next punishment if you breach a code the punishment is very it's not very clear what type of punishment you are going to receive and how do you know when you have broke the code so it's hard it's ineffective the punishments so that's another drawback now how is this code effective the effectiveness is limited because of this uh, presence of this certain factors what is it number 1 you can impose this code without communication also that means you just follow the code you don't know why you are doing it what is the importance of that code okay but if you do that if you try to force it like that just follow the code you don't communicate why you need to change remember your employees they are going to resent it later they will not be happy with it especially the employees second some codes what do they do they are just written and they are just kept in that place forever no one follows those code it's just you write it and you keep it there that's why you need some remind, uh, rem uh, reminders that this code is there you need to follow this code okay otherwise it will not promote in uh, ethical decision making you cannot make an ethical decision making if it's forgotten code is there but it's forgotten this happens quite very often nowadays right codes that are implemented and then breached by senior manager what happens if senior managers they don't follow this code okay and because they are not following the code they are not penalized remember even the junior staff are going to do the same they are not going to be followed by the junior staff why because they have seen that their senior manager is not following why should we do they are not paying any penalty why should we do so we also can breach the codes very simple because punishment is not clear right so for the code to be effective this things has to be there number 1 all groups needs to participate when the code is formed 
next disciplinary actions has to be there when someone is breaching the code there has to be certain penalty has to be there third publicity of breaches publicize that if this happens this is the legal action or these are the actions that will be taken against you make them feel that this is a very serious if this happens if codes are not followed is a serious offense this will help in promoting others to follow the code okay then communication and support from top down the top level people has to uh, help the down level people how by communicating by supporting them so that that code is there in the company culture that everyone from the day one if you join an organization it is there in the culture that it needs to be followed this code now we are moving to the sixth okay so uh, that's it now we are moving to the sixth professional code of ethics all this looks similar right corporate code of ethics professional code of ethics the codes don't worry now we are moving to profession that means more towards acca and accountants and all for profession also we have code of ethics we studied what is profession in the very beginning content what is the content of this professional code of ethics and what are the principles so professional code of ethics what are the content of it the content is in the content you have to say who is affected next the fundamental principles guidance on how to apply this ethics then under principle there are main principles that has to be followed by all members or all students okay now remember the professional code of ethics that are issued by the professional bodies which professional body in our case it is the acc that is the professional body okay they have certain professional code of ethics under acc we all know that this is reissued in 2006 okay it is revised and it is changed in 2006 why it is there why professional code of ethics is very important the main reason for having it to ensure that whether you are an acca member or a student proper standard is there when prop, uh, proper standards of professional conduct right when you are proper prop, professionally dealing with someone standard has to be of the top most quality right you cannot compromise on that if professional code of ethics is not there it's easy that you don't practice that you do not keep that standard if you misconduct okay if you are refrain from misconduct that means you are not involved whether a student whether a member not involved in any misconduct sorry uh, members and students because of that professional code of ethics they do not they do not uh, go into any misconduct okay they do not make serious departure from the ethical code that means they follow the ethical code okay if the standards are not observed what happens disciplinary action has to be taken okay so because of this professional code of ethics you are maintaining it what's happening account it helps the accountancy profession to act in the public interest okay now let us look at uh, let us look at the content we'll be having introduction in the introduction what is it it is basically the background to the code who gets affected how that code is enforced and what are the disciplinary proceedings if this thing is not being enforced or is not being done these are the disciplinary actions that we are going to take against you that thing is there in the introduction is given then fundamental principles acc has five fundamental principles all members all acc students has to follow them okay and these principles are stated in a summary form and not in detail conceptual framework it has four contents four sections okay under the content of professional code of ethics introduction fundamental principles and conceptual framework is the third under conceptual framework how these principles are actually applied remember principles cannot cover all the situations it cannot cover so the spirit of the principles must be complied with whatever it is okay you have to comply with it whatever the principle it is 
it is more like your attitude of mind that no you have to be ethical you have to go by the rule it's more like an ethical rather than just ticking the boxes even though principles cannot cover all situations you have to think that no you have to follow what is right at this situation even if the code does not have a certain code has not been there or something like that yeah finally detailed application how that principles are applied in specific situations now principles so first thing was content we went through content now let us move to the words principles every code of ethics they are based on some principles okay what are the main five are there this five memorize it this five needs to be memorized definition also needs to be memorized because throughout your acca paper especially your professional paper you need this five things this five never forget until you finish your acc exam don't forget this five even after that also you need but uh, for your exam purpose remember this memorize it integrity objectivity professional competence confidentiality and professional behavior sorry professional competence and you care okay let us see what does it mean so the meaning is here first integrity what does it mean you are being honest and straightforward in all your relationship whether business or whether personal that is the meaning of integrity but we are talking from the point of business so let us keep us the professional business relationship next objectivity when you are taking a decision you are not being biased you are not getting influenced by anyone it's your own independent decision third competence you have the appropriate skills and knowledge and if you don't have make sure that you update your knowledge so that you're competent enough for giving that level of service confidentiality whatever the information that you have got from your client even if you are not an employee any longer for that employer keep that information confidential do not give it to anyone do not disclose it if you have a specific uh, authority or you are given the permission by the owner yes you can disclose if it's for the public interest yes you can disclose other than that don't F professional behavior you should not do any such action should not be taken by you or you should follow the rules all the time okay these are the five ethical principles acc has built up on this five you need to be integral you need to be honest you need to be independent competent enough you should have the knowledge confidential means so you have to keep the knowledge confidential and behavior you should act in a professional behavior okay professionalism is has to be there so these are the five just have a look so fundamental ethical principles are obligations okay these are not just uh, for time pass or is just given there and if i don't do any one of it is okay no it's an obligation your responsibility that you have to make sure in any organ any any situation you have to be objective you have to have the confidentiality you have to be integrity has to be followed okay whether you are in practice or not whether you are practicing you are working or you are not working you are an ssc member principles apply to you you are an ssc student all those principles apply to you okay conceptual framework is basically just like a guidance how principles are applied third framework helps to identify threats to compliance what are the threats that will stop you from complying with those five principles what are the safeguards that you need to reduce this threat and five fundamental principles these are also known as accs code of conduct okay accs conducts because they are very integrated they are objective they are confidential everything now it is explained in more detail the five fundamental principles integrity remember these are not rules they are principles okay integrity you are truthful you are honest you are upright okay members are not required to be associated with any form of communication 
or report where the information is considered to be see being a member you cannot get involved in any form of communication or report which is materially false maybe that report it's not correct it's false materially false auditor should understand what is the meaning of materially false okay by a huge amount it's very significant a report is false okay but effect is very significant that's why it's known as materially false okay or containing some misleading statements statements are not correct or recklessly you are not being careful when you have provided this information or incomplete that if you do not include okay it's misleading if these three things is there any member acca member should not get involved with any such firm who does this they should not get involved with any report of like this form which which is falsely made not being careful incomplete okay because they have to be fair all the time they have to be, they have to be truthful they cannot give false report they cannot get involved also even if someone else is doing you being an ssc member you cannot get involved even if you are not the one who is doing it okay integrity objectivity you have to use your professional judgment okay that cannot be compromised at any time second there will be many situations later on you will come to know which can uh, where your objectivity could be compromised okay you should not do that you should not compromise your objectivity it should be intact okay professional competence and due care number 1 accountants you should as an accountant you should have the necessary professional knowledge okay to carry out the work for any client that means being an accountant any accountant you work for anyone basic debit entry this you should know if you do not know you are not said to be professionally competent you should know it number 2 you should follow technical as well as professional standards when you are giving the services okay for that we have appropriate levels of professional competence this must be attained and then maintained first you attain this whatever the professional uh, skills or knowledge you need first you get it require then after once you have got it maintain that okay you have to have your cpd complete continued professional development annually okay this requirements have to be met then when you are giving some service it has some limitations for example you are giving services okay where you have to rely solely on the client information okay then the client must be made aware of this for whom you are doing it for example you are giving a review of an accountant of a, of a financial statement of a client to the public you have to make it aware that you are just relying solely on the client information because when you are relying on it it has some limitations they might be telling you the right uh, they might not be telling you the whole truth that's why you have to make them aware due care it's like you are following, you are being being very careful right professional competence and due care then last uh, one before the last professional behavior all rules and regulations being an ssa member you need to follow second there is also a test also okay any action that is suggested by any third party has to be avoided only if it brings a discredit to your profession if you think that by doing it it will bring bring a discredit to the profession has to be avoided at any cost okay an accountant is required to treat all people contacted in a professional capacity with courtesy and consideration the way you are taking care of people dealing with it you have to be very you have to take everyone into consideration okay courtesy you cannot be rude you just cannot be rude if you are doing any marketing activities you should make sure that your profession is not being into dis, uh, disrepute okay you have to be very 
with me see very considerate of people okay and you have to be uh, courtesy you have to show all the time last confidentiality any information that you have obtained due to your relationship business relationship with the firm not disclose outside without being given the permission to do so second and it should not be used for any personal advantage even if you have got it okay so the need to maintain confidentiality is extended to cover the accountant social environment okay information about the prospective client and where business relationships have terminated okay so confidentiality is now confidentiality includes these things also now it is extended for example what are the accountants social environment what are the information about the prospective client there also you have to maintain confidentiality okay there must always be a reason for disclosure before confidential information is provided to third party without a reason valid appropriate reason you cannot disclose to a third party okay what are the main reasons for disclosure maybe it is permitted by law and authorized by the client second it is required by a law maybe uh, certain laws are broken and to the court you have to present it so you might it's required in the law third professional duty you have a professional duty to disclose which is not there in the law law does not say but your profession says so that you have to disclose for the public interest for example money laundering, money laundering has happened in an organization and you are made aware of it you have a professional duty at that time to disclose why because it is for the benefit of the public you can give this information to the professional institute okay or compliance with ethical requirements maybe you are following the ethical requirement and and when you are being ethical according to your ethics it says you have to disclose in that condition yes so these are the reasons other than these three reasons if there are any other reason you should not disclose remember that's why these three points are very important ethical considerations on disclosure when you are making disclosure ethically you have to consider okay accountants need to think when you are doing it which third party is going to get affected or what is the extent that they can get affected that if you disclose if any third party gets affected you have to see the extent of it second the amount of uncertainty that is there in a situation this will affect the extent of your disclosure okay that means more uncertainty means disclosure is limited or not made at all because during more certainty it becomes very difficult for you to disclose also even if you disclose it might not be appropriate to do so then when you are making a disclosure accountant has to make sure to the correct person you have to make the disclosure okay so that's uh, it for professional code of ethics now before we move on to our section number 7 that is conflicts of interest and ethical threats we'll be doing test your understanding number 2 test your understanding too here you have been given five uh, actions and you need to tell out of the five fundamental ethical principles which are breached in the following five first one an advertisement for a firm of accountants states that their audit services are cheaper their audit services are cheaper and more comprehensive than a rival firm number 2 an accountant prepares a set of accounts before undertaking audit so they are the one who are preparing and then they are take auditing it okay third a director discusses an impending share issue with a colleague at a golf club dinner 
Fourth, finance director attempts to complete the company's taxation competition following the acquisition of some foreign subsidies. After acquiring, they are going, going to do taxation competition. And finally, the fifth one is a financial accountant confirms that the report on his company is correct, even though the report omits to mention some important liabilities. Okay, so one by one, we'll see. The first one, it is in conflict with which one out of the five fundamental principles professional behavior why because they are saying their ones are cheaper and more comprehensive than their rival right audit services observe the same standards as accounting standard whether you are giving audit or not does not matter but saying that you are better than the rival you are not prof uh, following the you're not complying professional behavior okay or in other words saying that rival has a lower standard such as that this firm is not complying with professional standard. You're not complying with it. You are in conflict with professional behavior. Number two, where you are first making and then you are auditing that account. So accountant is losing objectivity. You're not objective. You're not independent. Because any error that you have made during preparation, you might not have identified them when you are reviewing it. Number three, where you are discussing about impending share issue in a golf club restaurant such information needs to be kept confidential remember it's very sensitive information so that's why discussing it in the public place is inappropriate okay because then it will not be confidential anymore if you discuss it outside number four where you are doing taxation computation after acquiring foreign subsidiary okay to for accountant to do that tax computation you need the knowledge of foreign countries taxation regime that has to be understood otherwise so this is your professional competence and due care right and fifth one is integrity issue of integrity why because you know that the report has not mentioned or hidden significant liability still you are saying the report is correct so you are saying the wrong thing false stuff you're not honest you're not accurate so it's integrity okay so that's it So coming to section 7 of the lecture that is conflicts of interest and ethical threads. Here we are going to cover all the threads to the fundamental principle. Now, so this is a chart which we are going to cover. In this part, conflicts of interest and ethical threads, we are only going to cover the conflicts of interest, the five conflicts of interest. Safeguard and conflict restoration we will be covering in the next uh, topic subtopic so the professional code of ethics it will be having some conflicts of interest and to overcome those conflicts of interest we have some safeguards and how do we uh, solve the conflict so the five conflicts of interest and this five conflicts of interest you have to know for all your acca people p level whether it is audit whether it is sbr whatever especially for your sbr and your audit people this five conflicts of interest is very important self-interest self-review advocacy familiarity and intimidation in audit also you are explained this coming to the safeguard safeguard you can be safeguarded uh, by your profession through your work environment or individually you can take safeguards and then the conflict restoration you have to obtain all the necessary information you have to consider causes of action okay so that covers the rest of the lecture now moving to conflicts of interest so this conflicts of interest and how you resolve this conflicts of interest are explained where in the conceptual framework okay you don't have to know in depth what is there and all this just understand that somewhere it is there which is known as conceptual framework okay why that framework is needed because through this framework, it's like a guide. Whenever you have a framework for certain thing, it's like a guide. Okay, so a framework is needed because it is impossible to define every situation. Okay, that where there will be threats to fundamental principles. What were the five uh, fundamental principles we covered in the early slide just some time back? Can you recall? Integrity, objectivity confidentiality professional behavior and professional competence and uk these are the five fundamental principles 
okay and there will be threat to this every, in every situation you cannot be object there will be some threat which will prevent you or which will stop you from being objective there will be some situation which will arise where you cannot follow the rule of con uh, where you cannot comply with confidential the principle of confidential right which is a fundamental principle which are the thread okay so every situation cannot be explained in a framework that if this happens this is what you need to do this is how you have to mitigate no it's just a guide a guideline okay a framework that different assignments whenever you do different assignments it will be having different threads not every assignment will have same thread and actions also that you suggest will be different for every assignment assignment means whatever you are the accounting or auditing or whatever you're doing caring for a client okay so it's not possible to give you a list that these are all the threads that can happen and all this direction but some things are there which are common but a framework what does it do then it helps you to identify those threads that there are some thread okay so this approach is preferable to following a set of rules having a principle is better than rules okay because rules you cannot follow every time we are going to study later why principle is better than rule or why in some condition rule is better than principle principle versus rule right code could be a in a form of principle or a rule now once a material threat has been identified you can take an action okay when you take an action your fundamental principle should not be compromised okay your compliance to the fundamental principle that is in every condition you have to be objective in every condition you have to have the uh, confidentiality it has to be there those five fundamental principles you cannot compromise no matter what so when you identify that there's a threat you have to take action so that those are not compromised and where conflicts arise in the application of fundamental principles what does it mean that means you want to be ethical so you want to be uh, you should want to show integrity or you want to show the objectivity or you are taking professional behavior you are acting in professionally you are acting but because you are doing it it is giving to, uh, rise to some conflict maybe it is going against your uh, self interest right maybe it's not helping you commercial is not helping you even the ethical is right so code of ethics will help you okay code of ethics it provides a guidance on how to resolve the conflict now so this are some list of threat to independence okay and possible effect on ethical behavior we are talking about more like from the point of ethics okay because this whole chapter is based on ethics only this lecture these are some examples this is not it but in the exam in the case study you need to find out if they say if they tell you to comment whether this company is being ethical or not or they fall they are conflict they are in being uh, in conflict do they have conflicting interest okay are they following all the fundamental principles if a question comes like that you should be able to tell based on this things which is there in the case study maybe in the case study it will not be given like this but through this understanding you should be able to know from the case study that will be given to you whether uh, which type of threat it is and what is the mitigating action that you should do okay so this i will not tell you to memorize but this you need to understand uh, this is very important part of the lecture okay this you better you understand this very clearly okay because threat to independence can 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 come from anywhere it can come from any one of this from the list or maybe which is not there in the list also so be very careful first one financial interest maybe an accountant has a share also in the client company where they are doing the accounting job they have a shares also in that company so because of that that accountant has a financial interest it's a threat to independence why because of that financial interest you cannot be independent you can, your accountant is not no longer independent now from the client so because of this how is going to affect your uh, ethical behavior and which you know, which uh, interest is this which, which sorry which thread is this out of the five threads that we have covered in bold you can see it is self interest thread why you have a interest it's your own interest self interest thread 
there are other five four types self review it's how do you know a self interest when you ever you have any kind of interest it is it comes under self interest thread this is not self review because self review means when you are checking something you are checking your own work that is known as self review you are auditing in a company where you are also make preparing financial statements that would come as self review thread here you are just being an accountant and having shares that's it you are not reviewing anything then we have another type of thread um, familiarity thread nothing to be familiar familiar means when you are becoming too familiar with the organization the accountant or the auditor then advocacy thread when you are working for the client you are advocating their position you are trying to show your client in a favorable position advocacy thread and intimidation thread intimidation thread means when you are pressurized to show uh, the organization that they are performing better while actually it's not that is known as advocacy pressurizing so out of the five none of the four is applicable for this case it's only self interest they are just having financial interest it could be anything financial non financial but mostly it is the financial interest that can bring a effect on the ethical behavior non financial interest not so much so it is self interest thread okay you can even memorize also if you want what type of uh, thread it is financial having financial interest is a self interest thread okay sometimes it could be more than one thread also for particular thing for example there will be a conflict okay he might want a dividend because he is having shares the accountant okay or he may want to hide liabilities or overstate assets to see because of that what happens he will want to hide the liabilities of the company and want to show more assets overstate assets why because if he overstate assets he is going to get better dividends from them right the company if he showing that the company is in a better position by overstating assets and showing less liabilities or hiding liabilities dividends no it will affect dividend dividends will improve dividends improvements he will get dividends now because he has interest now remember shares so that's why because of this because he has shares in a company he want to manipulate now he wants to show more assets and show less liability so he is not being ethical you understanding it's a self interest thread so even in your exam when they give you they will not tell you this 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 is a self interest thread now you have to identify on your own how will you identify it comes from certain words like here financial interest or self interest it's easier like that someone is having shares someone is having some dividend any kind of any link with the company with the client company it is self interest thread okay you just go by the definition and link if you are not because clearly they will not tell you this is self interest this is self review thread no you have to identify and it will come through practice the more questions you practice the more you will understand what type of thread it is okay and identifying the correct thread is very easy it's not actually hard okay and is very important uh, not only for spl even for your sbr even for your audit it's very important because it's a syllabus on its own okay in audit and all big syllabus now next these are some examples okay threat to independence financial interest again it's a, this time it's a auditor who is holding shares in a client company same situation this time it's an auditor not an accountant here it will be self interest thread to it could be a self review also i don't know why they have not included but it will be a self review thread as well if the auditor is checking but here they are just having financial interest self review also you can put here okay here also is the same thing because he wants dividend he will not be giving an honest audit report let's say the company is not performing well he will not try to he will want to show the company is performing well because it will affect his dividends the auditor's dividends because he is going to receive that from the client okay so he is not going to provide honest audit report that's again he is being unethical okay if there is any error he will hide it he wants to hide it now because he is a, he has a he he has his own motive now he don't he does not want to qualify the audit opinion he wants to show unmodified right audit opinion now close family member has an interest in assurance client okay it's a close family member again interest so the word interest will tell you it's a self interest it's a self interest thread here also is the same thing they might not want to qualify the audit opinion 
Why? Because they do not want to compromise the financial interest of their family member, family members linked of the auditor or the assurance firm. That's why they want to show unmodified audit report. This is also another type of threat, two types of threat. It's not only one to one. Sometimes one scenario can give rise to two, three threads, okay? In this itself and the other one is intimidation threat. Why? May be also, okay? It's more likely. Some is very, some uh, threads are very easy to link. For example, the word interest. He's having financial interest. He's having that interest. He's having that interest. We'll tell you that it's a self-interest threat. You, intimidation threat means what? It's like you're pressurizing someone to do a certain thing which is not ethical. That is the meaning of intimidation threat. You are intimidating the person. It could be anyone, especially the employees of a company. Okay. For example, if an employee, okay, the assurance client, what do they do? They may threaten to sack the family member. The family member of the auditor, they will they will threaten whom the auditor or the assurance firm, saying that we'll sack your family member if you do not if you give us a qualified audit report. So because of that, he is pressurized to give a clean audit report. Next, assurance partner plays golf on a regular basis with the chairman of the board of the assurance client. It's like an auditor is playing with the chairman. The audit is playing with the client. Golf. Okay. What happens? Familiarity thread. You become familiar with the company. So because of this, what happens? What is the effect on the ethical behavior? Company financial statements. It might not be the correct financial statements. Okay. Why? Because you will always have this fear of losing the friendship with the chairman, being an auditor. No one wants to lose a friendship with the chairman, no? Because he's a top most, top level person and it affects your fees and everything. So you want to keep your friendship. That's why you will be, again, financial statements. You'll be showing it in a favorable term, favorable light, right? Now, fee. Due from a client is old and the assurance firm is concerned about the payment of that fee. You have not received the fee long time. What happens? Intimidation threat. Okay. What do they do? They default on the payment. Unless more work is carried out by the assurance firm. They tell the assurance firm, listen, you do more work for us and we'll give you the payment. So they try to pressurize the audit firm by telling them to work more for them and then they will be paid because there's a huge amount of fee right if, if you are losing one fee from a client that means it's a huge thing okay so what happens because of that the report that the assurance firm gives is will be biased okay Next, a company offers an assurance partner an expensive car at a considerable discount. What happens? It's again a self-interest because that auditor will have a self-interest. He wants in the company car and all, no? So because of this, what happens? It's okay. He wants to. He wants the car, but it's not ethical. Why? It's appearing that he's taking a bribe by the client. He's being bribed by accepting that car. And what happens? The partner, they can accept the car and they might not report this. Right? Which is a self-interest thread. Next, a close family member is a director of a client company. That means an auditor is a director of a client. What happens? Again, familiarity thread. Because the auditor becomes very familiar with the client company if he's a director also. So because of this, what happened? Everything affects in your audit report. Remember, opinion that you are going to give is not correct. It will be biased. They do not want to qualify the audit report. Okay. So it's unethical. All this is unethical. An assurance partner serves as an officer on the board. Self-review as well as self-interest. Because you are going to review your own work now. Any mistake you do, you are going to avoid it. Simply, you don't. You want to... You don't want to show why
because you are the one who is doing it and you are also checking so it's very easy that even if you are making a mistake you will not try to show it you will try to hide it okay again okay, these are unethical now so that's it for conflicts of interest and ethical threat these are the eth ethical threats there will be more than this okay you need to read the case study and understand better what type of threat it is sometimes it could be advocacy if you are advocating for the client sometimes familiarity self-review self-interest or intimidation threat anything please look for it in your case study now we are moving to section number eight conceptual framework and safeguard in section seven we went through the threads now how to overcome those threads the safeguard so safeguards could be from the profession work environment or individual let us read. it could be explained as follows a conceptual framework whatever the assumptions the values are there in the conceptual framework okay next it is stated relatively in general terms so it is easy to understand and communicate it's in a very general form that's why it's very easy to understand and communicate also ethical issues they do not have a correct or a wrong answer okay understand this please from from everyone's point of view ethical issues might be different okay that's why the guidelines for ethical issues are very generalized okay next safeguards what do safeguards do they reduce they either reduce or they eliminate it completely the threat but in real world it's not easy to eliminate you cannot eliminate the threat entirely very rarely it happens but yes you have to take measures to reduce the threat you cannot keep silent once you know there's a threat to your independence you cannot sit back you need to take actions and they fall into three categories the safeguards fall into three categories first is profession what does it include how can you minimize if you go by the profession in your profession go for cpd requirements go for more training go for more education because the more educated the more trained you are the more you are earning the continued professional development the lesser will be the uh, thread setting of corporate governance regulations and professional standards has to be there that below the standard you are not going to perform then monitor how do you monitor you include disciplinary proceedings for example if you are not complying by certain rules or you are not going by the certain standard what happens you are called for disciplinary actions so through this you can monitor are they being objective confidential or anything like that now we are moving towards work environment from work environment how can you safeguard put internal control system in your organization then review have this procedure review procedure that someone has to review the work then disciplinary procedures has to be there remember if there are no disciplinary actions no one is going to take the threats seriously and no one is going to take any actions to safeguard to protect that's why disciplinary procedures are very important in any environment okay organization code of ethics make sure there are code of ethics that every employee knows and they follows separate review and reporting for key engagements okay for individual one needs to comply with professional standards what the professional standard says if they say you you have to keep the confidential information confidential you have to do it if you don't you are not complying then maintain the record of contentious uh, contentious issues then mentoring you have to mentor the individuals are they following the safeguard then contacting professional bodies with queries yes you can contact your professional bodies if you have any issues now ethical threats and safeguard an ethical threat what is it ethical threat means it is it could be any situation where a person is tempted not to follow their code of ethics okay what what are your five fundamental principles under code of ethics integrity okay objectivity professional behavior professional competence and due care so an ethical thread means let's say a situation comes where it will where you are tempted not to be objective whereas ethical says your code of ethics says you have to be objective all the time okay that is an ethical thread it's a thread to you and safeguard is what 
it is any course of action that removes or that reduces the ethical thread ethical threads apply to accountants whether in practice or in business okay it can apply to any accountant and safeguard also depending it depends on the specific type of thread that it is okay you cannot use the same safeguard for all the type of threads remember that and professional accountant must always be aware that fundamental principles may be compromised whenever an accountant is going when you also as a professional tomorrow when you become an accm member you go to audit or uh, for accounting in any company you always have to be very careful and be aware that any time fundamental principles can be breached any time it might be broken that's why you always have to look for methods of mitigating any threat that is identified for the first time okay you have to see whether you can identify certain type of thread or not okay now so ethical threads and safeguards inducement giving and receiving conflicts between employer and fundamental principles we are going to cover all this in detail by the way okay preparing and reporting and information financial interest sufficient expertise whistle blowing and confidential information okay so let's see ethical thread and safeguard let us explain first one was what conflict between requirement of the employer and the fundamental principles sometimes what employer wants might be different from the fundamental principles it's a conflict it's an ethical thread for a new accountant especially what are the safeguard against it okay okay one example for it for that for example acting contrary to laws or regulations or against the professional technical standards you are acting against the law or against your professional standard could be anything example is what this type of thread is known as what intimidation thread because you are forced to go against the law or against the professional standard by whom by your employer that's why it is intimidation thread how are you going to safeguard you can get some advice from the employer okay or employer is providing a formal dispute resolution process he himself is doing it or you can seek for legal advice okay because you are going against the law so better to seek le some legal advice what could be the uh, repercussions of not going by the law and all those stuff so that's it and next coming to the next type of thread preparing and reporting on information what happens when you are preparing and reporting on information how can this be a thread see accountants are always told you need to prepare a report on objective a fair report right but accountants might be pressurized to give some misleading information to hide some information what type of thread is it if i ask you again it's an intimidation threat because you are forced whenever you are forced to do something pressurized to do something intimidation threat immediately intimidation has to come in your mind what are the safeguard one is you can consult with any superiors in the employing company who the company that has employed consult with some superiors in that company second consult with those charged with governance for example non executive directors you can talk about audit committee you can talk about you can talk to for consultation with the relevant professional body if you are an acca member contact with acca coming to the third type having sufficient expertise okay how this can be a thread whenever you are having a certain level of expertise you have to mention that as it is not too much not beyond that because if you write too much of expertise you are actually misleading your employer so never write even in your cv that you have more expertise than you actually you do have okay write whatever you have next because what happens how it can be a thread if you are showing more expertise because sometimes what happens you will be having a lack of expertise in a certain field and you will be given a job in that field only that time you cannot tell that i cannot do because you know your expertise and you yourself only wrote that you yourself know it inside that you are not sufficient for it 
because of that it will affect your lack it will affect your if you're an auditor it will affect your quality of audit okay you'll be having a huge time pressure to carry out the duties if you don't have that expertise you have to work more which will uh, it's a huge amount of time you have to give okay because first of all you will not be having uh, enough information as well as insufficient experience so insufficient experience is very diff uh, very dangerous uh, position never go reach there okay it's just my uh, personal advice also from my personal experience never give that if you have insufficient information you still can work on it you can somehow get it but if you have an insufficient experience that's a very dangerous thing you should never do that okay because today or tomorrow all of us or you will be going for a job you'll be applying for it you in a cv you might not be having any audit experience and you'll be writing i have three years experience and four years experience you know don't do that because at the end is you is going to suffer save what if you don't have enough expertise obtain it go for additional training second more time you have to negotiate more time for your duties because if you have experience you can work more quickly if you are an experienced in your field you see and you take an inexperienced person and see which one out of the two takes less time to finish their duty it will be the one who is more experienced always is like that in anything the one who is more experienced takes less time to perform their duties than the one who has taken more time so give more time to the ones who is not experienced then you need assistance from someone who has the expertise relevant expertise work with them now financial interest this is also a thread this is one of the easiest okay to identify in terms of uh, identifying threat okay it could be anyone maybe the accountant has a financial interest in the company or the his family member okay maybe examples include the accountant are paid bonuses based on the results of the company maybe they have some shares in the company so if the company performs better their bonuses are higher it's a self interest threat i have told you any interest is self interest threat what are the safeguard when remuneration is being uh, done set it should be set by the other members of management you should never set your own remuneration because definitely if you said you will be putting your remuneration high only so you are not being objective you are not independent you should you should be very objective in that okay and no one can be objective when it is setting their own remuneration that's why you have to give someone else to do it then disclose disclosure of relevant interest to those charged with governance whatever the interest you have in the company if you are an accountant or an auditor whether you have some family close family member in an organize in that organization or uh, you have some share options you need to disclose it to whom to those charged with governance to those charged with governance may, uh, might be the audit committee or the non executive director and anyone like that consultation with superiors or relevant professional body you have to consult most of the time consultation is a very common uh, safeguard it's used for any type of threat so this is a very safe way for you to uh, write your answer if you are confused with other stuff just write consult okay next inducement receiving offer is it okay to receive uh, bribe what do you think it's ethical threat no that you are going to receive some incentives if you encourage unethical behavior it's unethical right say so inducements could be in any form maybe you will be given some very expensive gift maybe you are given uh, preferential treatment over the others or hospitality right okay so what happens what are the two uh, fundamental principles that are going to get threatened by this one is objectivity one is confidentiality objectivity for sure because you are going to be influenced by the gifts and everything that you are receiving so you are not objective you are not more independent confidentiality why sometimes you might have to give them confidential uh, information to receive that bribe which is again not ethical so what are the safeguard and it's a self interest thread also it's 
So three objective video configuration self interest. Because you'll be having interest, you know, you're getting those inducement. Do not accept the inducement as simple safeguard. Do not just say no, no for any kind of offers or bribes or anything. Second, inform the relevant third parties. It could be anyone, your senior manager or the professional advisor. But after taking legal advice, always take legal advice when it comes for bribes, when you are being bribed by someone. Okay. Next, now you are giving offer, you are giving it to someone. Earlier it was you accepting, so say no. Okay. Sometimes what happens, an accountant or a senior uh, member could give inducements to the junior member. Or they might do it to obtain some confidential information from the junior member. It could happen in either way. It's an intimidation threat because you are pressurizing by giving them offer. So do not offer the inducement. Next, confidential information. Accountants should always keep any kind of information that they receive during their uh, contact with the employers confidential unless they have some right to disclose or they have received that authorization from the client saying yes you can disclose to the third party otherwise you cannot disclose okay but accountants sometimes they are under pressure to disclose this okay why maybe they have to comply with what legal process for example anti money laundering sometimes it happens so due to that the law says you have to disclose so in this situation what happens there's a conflict whether you have to uh, keep the information confidential or you need to disclose according to the legal law for money laundering it's a conflict right what is the safeguard Disclose information in compliance with relevant statutory requirements. If the law says disclose, disclose it, even if you are compromising on your confidentiality. One example is money laundering regulations. It's not for any type of compliance. It has to be a very big reason if it is so. Why? Because it is for the public interest. Public interest. Money laundering is a very big thing. It's going to affect the public. That's why you need to disclose it. That's that condition is important even more than uh, keeping the confidentiality disclosing is more important now whistle blowing there should be uh, places in the organization where if any things go wrong they can complain about it if they see certain ethical rules are broken by the client there should be whistle blowing in practice otherwise it will keep on going so safeguard is what Follow the disclosure provisions of the employer. For example, you need to report to those responsible for governance. If anything happens, report to whom? Responsible for governance. Otherwise, this disclosure should be based on what? Assessment of legal obligations. Do you have any legal obligations? Or whether the members of the public, the society, will it be badly affected? What is the gravity of the matter? It is very serious likelihood is it going to be repeated in the future you think it's going to get repeated reliability when you're whistle blowing when you're complaining how reliable is it the information reasons why employee does not want to disclose you have to see why the employee doesn't want to disclose so these are some things that comes you need to assess based on these things so now we are moving to section 9 that is ethical dilemmas and conflict restoration. Here we are going to go under rule based approach, principle based approach, and ethical conflict uh, resolution. So, as I've told you, it could be the code, could be rule based or principle based. If it's rule based, what are the benefits? If it's a rule, it's very easy to check whether you are complying with the rules or not. Okay? Because it is based on fact. There are evidences that you have followed the rule or not. That's why it's easy to check. Second, easy to amend the rule. You can easily amend the rule if it's required. Disadvantages are that list of rules may not be complete. Not all the list give, is given for all the situation. It does not take uh, into picture all the situations. Then, there is no room for individual decision making you cannot do. Rule is same for everyone. 
Okay. Coming to principle base, what are the benefits? Recognizes every threat cannot simply be listed like rules. That for this, this is the rule. For this, no. That's why principle is very general. It's open ended. That's the benefit. Second, subjective judgment could be made. According to your specific situation, you will apply the principles. According to that. Disadvantages are what? It's difficult to check, unlike rules. It's difficult to check whether you've complied or not. Okay? Because the two people might see the same scenario in two different ways and they might make two different decisions based on that. And both might be, they might be right in their places, from their places. So, how can you resolve the ethical conflicts? Follow the steps. There are eight steps. You need to follow this. This is how you need to give answers in your exam. Whether it is any exam for ethical question, this is the eight stages. And this step needs to be followed in this order only. First of all, gather all the relevant facts. Facts about what? Ethical facts. Whether they are breaching any ethical rules or not. First, gather all the facts. Data has to be there with you. Without data, you cannot say he is being unethical or they are, they are breaching the rule and all. Second, ethical issues. What is the ethical issue that is involved? Third, refer to relevant fundamental principles. Remember the five fundamental principles. What are they? Integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, professional competence, and UK and professional behavior. These are the five. You always have to keep, uh, remember it. You cannot forget. You have to refer to this out of these five principles which are bridged. Is it objectivity? Is it the confidentiality? Then follow established internal procedures. Internally, the internally in the inside your organization, you need to follow some procedure. For example, you should have the control in place. Maybe internal control, you have to improve it. Maybe you are um, training your staff. Whistle blowing are there in the correct places like this internally externally at this stage you are not doing anything once you identify that this are the principles that is getting affected number five investigate alternative causes of action don't just stick with one action always look for alternative causes of action maybe they might be better than this consult with appropriate persons within the firm not every person in the firm is important or appropriate for it you have to find out consult with appropriate if you're having a marketing thing, you will consult with marketing uh, manager, not with financial manager, not with any other manager. So it's like that. Number seven, obtain advice from professional institute. And number eight, if the matter after doing all this eight, seven steps, if it is still unresolved, you have to withdraw from that engagement. You cannot be an accountant in that firm or an auditor for that client. No, withdraw. Okay. So that's it for the ethical uh, dilemmas and conflict resolution. Before we go to section 10, that is corruption and bribery, we'll be doing test and understanding 4 and 5. Test your understanding 3. So here you have been given 3 ethical threats and you need to explain your response okay that means the safeguards that you are going to apply okay response means safeguard how are you going to respond to the ethical threat the meaning is safeguard so number one a your employee asks you to suggest to a junior manager that they are going to receive a large bonus for working over time on a project to hide liabilities from financial statements second you are selecting employee but you are advised to discriminate unfairly against one section of workforce and third you are prepared you are asked to prepare management accounts for a subsidiary that is located in south america in accordance with their requirements but you are not you do not understand the accounting requirements of that country that's there or the supervisor states no problem no one will notice a few thousand dollars error anyway this has some ethical threat let us see the safeguard so the first one if you can understand Okay, it is like an inducement. You are giving a large bonus, means you are giving inducement. So, in that case, what are the safeguards? Do not offer the inducement. Number two, 
if there are any conflict resolution process by the employer do it follow and third what could be the impact on the financial statements if it is misrepresented you have to consider this this is same class thread b where you are discriminating unfairly you are so here you have to obtain advice advice from the employer your professional organization second employer providing this formal dispute resolution process or legal advice you can take and the last one where you do not understand the jurisdiction the south americans accounting requirements but you are anyway told to present it okay so what are you supposed to do you obtain additional training since you don't have enough expertise in that because you don't have expertise negotiate more times for duties more time has to be given to you and you need to have got assistance from someone who have relevant expertise in that field so these are some safeguard for the three threats so coming to section number 10 corruption and bribery here we are going to cover what is corruption why corruption is wrong from ethical argument why corruption is wrong from a business argument assessing the risk, uh, risk exposure and anti bribery and corruption procedures or you can say ab and c procedures because there is a risk for any corruption or bribery that's why we have to assess it now what is corruption we all know but do you know that it is in today it is one of the world's greatest challenges why it is the greatest challenges because it's if there is any problem anywhere in the world whatever the problem it's easy to solve those or somewhat it has been minimized by some actions but corruption is the only one okay which is day by day is increasing only it's not reducing if you see in any part of especially in undeveloping countries or underdeveloped countries corruption is at at peak i would say okay and corruption is corruption could be in various form not only in that organizations you expect taking bribes and all corruption could be in any form okay and bribery is one form of corruption by the way we are going to study some more one example okay for example kpmg they surveyed the putsi 100 companies in 2009 and they found that at least two third that is around 66 point uh, or 67 percent okay they said that they are not able to do business in some countries because they accept bribery or they accept corruption or it's like part of their culture they are okay with it that's where around 67% said they cannot do business in those countries and out of it only 35% have actually stopped doing businesses there 35 that means out of 67 only 35 half of it only what about the rest they are still carrying on they are still carrying on businesses right and which companies are we talking about here the futsi 100 companies it's not just any company that are involved in this bribery and corruption so now you can understand what is the significance and what is the impact of this corruption okay it has its hands everywhere okay the world bank in fact told that bribery has become a 1 trillion dollar industry 1 trillion dollar can you understand can you just imagine the size that's how big bribery is that's why we need to study this bribery in sbl why unethical it's against our ethics because of bribery you cannot be integrate uh, you cannot be honest because of bribery you cannot keep information confidential because of bribery you cannot be objective because of bribery you cannot follow your professional behavior that's the reason why bribery we are studying here okay so i'm not trying to promote a bribery here or promoting the culture okay i'm by saying there is a 1 trillion company or a business that's why everyone have to go there no please don't do that okay it is totally unacceptable unethical and it should never be accepted so what is corruption <clears throat> that was just an intro guys corruption could be a corruption is a behavior okay that means you are given some responsibilities and you violate those you do not you're not uh following the 
or you're not complying with the rules that you're supposed to do. You're not keeping the trust with the responsibilities that you are given. You are violating it. Why? Because you want to get some advantages, undue advantage. And that advantage could be in any form. Financial, non-financial. Okay? Maybe for yourself or maybe for someone else. But it's a corruption. Okay? This, the main forms of corruption is embezzlement, fraud and extortion. These are not same, these are similar. Uh, this looks same, but they're not same. They're different. Each has different meaning. Go Google it and check the meaning. Okay. Now, these are some examples that includes corruption, bribery, excessive hospitality you are being given, bribe in terms of money or treatment or facilities that you are given, facilitation payments, buying votes, illicit payments to political parties, misappropriation of public funds so corruption could be in any form now why corruption is wrong this is from ethical point from ethical point of view it is inherently wrong that means corruption in itself is wrong it's the wrong thing it should not be done no matter what form of corruption it is, whether big or small, whether the amount is small or big, whether the bribe, the amount that you are giving is $1 or $100. Corruption, what is bad is bad. It should not be accepted, means it should not be accepted. Okay? Because corruption, whether your intentions are good or not, does not matter. Corruption, if it's done once, it will be done forever. You cannot stop it. It's like a, keeps on, it's like a cycle. It keeps on going. There is no end to it. Okay? Because it's a misuse of power and a position. And because of this misuse, it has a disproportionate disadvantage for the poor. The impact is disproportionate. Maybe you are misusing or maybe the amount that you are bribing or corruption is small. But the impact it is having on the poor people or the disadvantaged people is huge, disproportionate. then undermines the integrity of all of all those who are involved in this it damages the reputation of the organization the reputation of everyone who's involved there it damages the reputation of the profession that you are involved accountant or auditor or whatever one great example is enron what happened to author edison we all know that right the audit also got involved with the case and then after that I don't have to tell you, right? You all know what happened. Then, the reality is that laws, whatever the laws are there in place nowadays, you see, there are so many laws, bribery laws, anti-bribery laws, whatever it is. They make the corrupt practices criminal. There will be a, some criminal actions, uh, criminal offense. It's a criminal offense now. It's not a small offense, by the way. Don't take corruption for a joke. Okay? but may not always be enforced okay what does it mean even if they say that in certain countries there are not there are no any legal rules on corruption or they don't say corruption is illegal does not mean or it does not justify that you still can accept corrupt practices or corruption you cannot in any condition whether the country says it is acceptable, country makes it legal, or there are not uh, such punishments for corruption, you still cannot accept corrupt practices because it's a bad thing. It's like uh, we are saying smoking is bad. You should never smoke. You should give up if you're doing. So smoking under any condition, whether your intention was right or whether you are doing because you are depressed, whatever it is, it's never going to be right. It's always going to it's always remain going to remain dirty and bad for health right same corruption is like that so you have to fight corruption in all the forms in all your places in in your life whether in, in your personal life or whether in your professional life you have to fight corruption 
because that's the right thing to do. Ethics is there from the ethical argument. Coming to the business argument, what does business argument says? Legal risk, there are legal risk for it. If you are found guilty in the corruption, you have to find a huge penalty and it affects your reputation and everything. It's not just the cost that you have to pay to the lawyer to defend you, also the reputation. Okay, even money cannot uh, give you the reputation once it's lost. Maybe cases and all you might win with some few money here and there, but what about your reputation of you, your organization, your profession? That's not going to come back. Reputational risk, as I told you before, even greater than the legal risk. Financial cost is there, yes. Pressure to repeat often. Once you are found in the corruption, okay, and you can see that you have got the benefit, okay, through that. Because we know that normally when you don't accept corruption, it re some documents or something you need to pass or some actions you want to do, it really takes long amount of time when you go to the offices and all, the government offices. But through corruption, if you bribe them, things can be done earlier. So what happens? Due to that, you are induced, right? You keep on repeating, repeating, repeating. Blackmail. Sometimes you might be blackmailed. Once you offer someone something, you next time will be blackmailed again that you have to offer. Otherwise, they are going to tell about you. They are going to disclose your name or they are not going to give you what you want. So you are blackmailed. Impact on the staff. If the junior staff sees the senior staff accepting bribes, giving bribes, and there are no legal actions or there are no any disciplinary things in the organization taking against them, junior members soon they are going to take it okay they are going to accept it and they are also going to it it's going to uh, it's going to be a part of a culture then everyone is going to do no matter what okay impact on development any organization that is involved in corruption maybe over a short period of time yes they are going to get some financial benefit and everything they might become rich and all but over a long time it's not they are not going anywhere Okay, it's not going to develop them at all. So all these things are from the business argument why corruption is wrong. So whether ethical, whether business, corruption is wrong. Nowhere you will see that corruption is right. They will not say, not even one person. Okay, so don't try to find uh, the arguments against this, okay? Why, that it could be right also, no. Assessing risk, uh, risk exposure. You have to uh, consider this relevant factor. When you see this, uh, how risky it is. Number one, the country. Particular country in which you want. Some country, yes, corruption is there too much, too high. And it's very risky there. Some country where it is accepted uh, legally and all, even if you're involved, it's not so risky. So you have to assess. Second, sector in which you're dealing. Some sectors, Bribe is very natural in some sector. Some, it's not like that. The, the risk will be high. Great. Okay. Value and the duration of your project matters. Kind of business you want to do. Okay. People you engage to do your business. All those things, factors you have to take into consideration. Okay. Now, evaluating anti-bribery and corruption procedure. What is the meaning of anti-bribery? Against bribery and corruption. Means to stop bribery. No bribery, no corruption. Okay, when you want to set up such procedure, how do you evaluate? Based on proportionality. Okay. It has to be proportion. Number two top level commitment if you want to stop bribery top level people has to get involved they have to be committed first so that the lower people it goes to the lower level stuff through the top risk assessment you have to see how risky it is okay the procedures is it risky or not both communication you need to communicate this procedures to the staff due diligence you have to see with due diligence whether it could be accepted or not 
six monitoring and review just impl uh, impl uh, implementing it once is not okay you every time you have to monitor and review whether it's actually working or not the anti bribery and corruption procedures okay now these are some examples okay that measure the these are some examples of measures that include improve reporting okay you can see whether your reporting has improved or not could be a measure screening of staff and associate when you are taking staff okay you are going to say that if someone accepts bribe or is a part of part of that culture you are not going to take them okay you are not going to recruit those staff accounting policies for accounting policies what are we going to do how are we going to stop the bribery and corruption high level approval for certain categories of payment certain categories of payment needs very high level of approval if a middle level manager the normal manager who always approves a payment if he approves is not going to work top level people okay more approval is needed for certain categories of payment depth of audit audit has to be done in depth clear and transparent procurement regulations has to be there controls on the setting of prices and discount because most of the time it has been seen that this the prices and the discounts are the things that are being that that are changed people try to manipulate this make sure it's very strict controls are there and guidelines for handling major bits there has to be some guidelines so through this measure you can reduce it up to some uh, limit okay the corruption and bribery now barriers to implement everything whatever you to what i have explained to you in the earlier slide is okay it looks good in theory but in practice there are some barriers you just cannot implement it like that why competitive advantage you can see everyone is getting involved in corrupt corruption and bribery and they are getting the advantage they are getting things done faster and you don't want to be left over left behind them if you are not being corrupt so automatically you cannot follow the anti barrier and corruption policies because of competitive because they are your competitors will be having a competitive advantage over you second managerial uh, apathy you feel you can get your work done faster through bribery and corruption rather than going through the long road which is the normal without bribery and corruption so you go third off the shelf solutions okay normally the policies for the anti bribery and corruption they are off the shelf policy uh, solutions that means they might not be relevant for your specific thing it is general general policy corporate structure maybe your structure is in designed in such a way okay that is it's hard to implement this policies for example there are five six layers and if you have to approve a certain payment all the time you cannot contact the five six layers of uh, and take their approval it takes time it takes a long time shadow hierarchies same as i have told you for corporate structure sometimes what happens there might be some level uh, some people in an organization maybe in the hierarchy their position is not so high but they have a huge amount of power and influence so like that also they can go ahead with their corruption and bribery things and all and they are being hidden no one knows about it because in the hierarchy they are not being shown so excessive pressure to hit targets this also means you are more likely to take bribes and corruption because you have to hit the target no matter what during a short period of time culture of secrecy if you are following corruption and bribery the anti policy you have to disclose your remuneration right so all this is not liked by many managers executive directors and all because they want to hide so culture of secrecy is there so because of this culture also is hard to implement this policies right heterogeneous cultures cultures are not the same not everyone wants to implement this policies okay cultures are different that's why due to this reasons it's barrier you cannot implement it's not impossible but it become it's like a barrier it makes it more harder to implement the anti barrier and corruption 
procedures now we are going to do test your understanding four and five before we move on to the last two sections that is section 11 and section 12. test your understanding four so this question is regarding facilitation payment okay you need to outline some action that a could take okay this is regarding a who has to take the action a so let's read the case study a medium-sized company has acquired a new customer in a foreign country b b is the new customer in a foreign country okay new customer and where it operates through its agent company c so its private risk assessment has identified facilitation payments as a significant problem in securing reliable importation into B, that means into that foreign country, and transport to its new customers' manufacturing locations. This sometimes takes the form of inspection fees required before B's import inspectors will issue a certificate of inspection and thereby facilitate the clearance of goods. Who is giving this? The foreign country. The new customer is a foreign country, B. Okay, they are giving you an certificate of inspection to whom a that means you are supposed to get give some inspection fees and once you give it you get a certificate of inspection that says that it has been inspected your good is right uh, could be delivered now because usually it takes a long time for your goods to go from one location to another. But when you give this facilitation uh, payment, that is in form of what inspection fee, whatever name it could be in any name. Okay. Now you can get the goods early, deliver the goods earlier. Okay. In the foreign country. So let's read what action you should take. Action means whenever they say what action a company could take means ethical actions they have to the same cost that they have to go by okay because facilitation is a form of what corruption right corruption so the answer is a little bit long okay but we are just going briefly through it we are not reading line by line everything in detail you just understand the main uh, idea of how to answer questions on facilitation payments what are the actions that one can take when a facilitation payments are given which is not correct it's unethical given that facilitation payments are normally viewed as an example of bribery and corruption this should be uh, this a should consider the following a should do all this okay you are talking from the point of a first communicate Communicate that you are not going to accept any facilitation payment to whom to C and its staff. Why C? Because C is the agent. Through C, you are going to B. So, first you have to tell C that listen, we are not going to pay any facilitation payment. No inspection fee has to be paid to B or anyone. Communicate. Second, seek advice on the law of B. Because B is a separate country, new country, you need advice on the laws of a new country when you are doing a business with it. So, seek advice. Regarding what? The certificate of inspection that you are going to get from B. And also the fees that you are giving to B. Okay. For this to differentiate between properly, see, sometimes you have to pay fees, okay. But they are some, they are properly payable fees that anyone has to pay. It's not, it's not called as facilitation payment. Okay. If it's facilitation payments, means it's only they are taking it from some or you are the one who is paying. Not It's not being payable by others. So that uh, you facilitate the process of delivering goods early before the time it takes normally. That is known as facilitation payment. So see whether this certification of uh, certificates that you are receiving and the fee that you have to pay, inspection fee, is it proper or it is a facilitation payment? You need that's why you need to seek advice. Okay. Third, build a realistic time scale. When you are planning for the project, realistic time scale you have to plan. You cannot, let's say you are planning that this will take two years. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, this is for planning of the project, shipping and importation. Let's say you are taking two months. 
okay you are planning but it takes 3 months definitely if it takes more than the time that you have planned definitely people will come and give you the facilitation they will want to facilitate it because no one can wait that long no one wants to wait long so time scale when you are setting in such a way how long it will take from shipping importation and delivery schedule you have to make a realistic time scale okay so that no one can demand for facilitation payment to get things done faster no one can resist later on this this could be done earlier than the required time by giving payments now realistic time scale fourth you are requesting that c train its staff why c c is the agent remember a is using a agent c through which they are entering market b which is a foreign country so c is an agent you can train their staff you can request them to train their staff so that they resist any demand from of facilitation payment they don't accept any facilitation payment okay and also train them on the relevant local law such as uk bribery act 2010 there is a law like that but you don't have to know the detail because it will not be asked in the exam also or as we are but just know that there's there are laws okay on bribery bribery is not something that uh, we always say you should not accept you should not give there is a proper law on that now proposing or including as part of any contractual arrangement in your contract make certain things included for whom for c and its staff to follow c is again the agent in that contract this things could be there okay questioning of legitimacy of demands when you are demanding question the legitimacy it should be questioned this should be there in the contract if someone demands from your payment you have to see whether it is legitimate or not you have to question who has to question the agent and the staff of the agent second legitimacy requesting receipts and identification details of the official making the demand when someone demands a payment from you that give me this and i will be and your work will be done earlier you have to make sure that you request for receipts and identification of that person the one who is making that demand that official at the duty third request to consult with superior officials you should be allowed to consult with superior officials okay number 4 trying to avoid paying inspection fees if it is not properly due you should avoid paying it you should not pay in cash and directly to an official you should not pay in cash to any official no matter what five informing those demanding payments that compliance with the demand may mean that a and possibly c will commit an offense under a's domestic law a in the country that's your country okay so according to your law your local law you have to write it in a contract that if okay they are accepting they are they are okay they are willing to pay they are responding to the demand it has to be there in the contract that you are breaching the law of a or it could be c also maybe c is an agent maybe it might be in country b or country a anything but you have but you are committing an offense it has to be there under the contract okay written and finally the last clause informing those demanding payments that it will be necessary for c to inform a country's embassy of the demand you have to whoever is demanding tell them that if you demand from me the c who is an agent they will inform the a's country embassy of the demand because c is working for a on behalf of a remember okay So these are the lists that has to be in the contract, and these are some more safeguards. Maintaining close liaison with C. C is an agent. Make sure that you are very, you have a very close relationship with C, so that if there are any changes locally, you can keep up with C and come up with a solution. And you have to encourage C so that they can come up with their own strategies based on their local knowledge. C is a person who has a local knowledge of B, a different country. So make sure. or encourage them that they develop their own strategies also sometimes why because they are the one who has more no local knowledge than you do okay use of any diplomatic channels or participation in locally active non governmental organization so as to apply pressure on the authorities of b 
to take action to stop demands of others. Yes, you can force, you can pressurize them that you are not that they have to stop their demand for facilitation payment. Otherwise, you are going to go to the non-governmental organization NGOs. You are going to take help of NGOs. It's basically you are just giving them a thread so that they get scared and then they don't they don't demand. Yeah, so that's this are some list and this okay. Just change the name of the company PC in your exam. Also, if such things comes up, what are the safeguards? What are the actions one can do? You can possibly list some of these things. I will not say me memorize answers because every question is different, unique. But these points are common. This you can apply. Just change the name of the company rather than BOC. It would be some other company given to you in the case study. So that's it. Test your understanding five. You are required to recommend some steps to L that he can take in this situation. So L identifies this as raising potential bribery risk. Okay, how they can overcome this? Let us see what is it. A company L exports a range of seed products to growers around the globe. So they are into exporting. Its representative travels to a foreign country M to discuss with a local farming cooperative the possibility, uh, the possible supply of new strain of wheat that is resistant to a disease which region uh, recently swept the region so there's a disease and this new strain of weight in a particular farm in country m helps to uh, resist that disease in the meeting the head of the cooperative tells else representative about the problems with the relative uh, unavailability of antiretroviral drugs caused locally in the face of high hiv infection rate so in a subsequent meeting with an official M to discuss the approval of L's new weight strain for import, the official suggests that L could pay for the necessary antiretroviral drugs and this that this will be a very positive factor in the government's consideration of the license. So they, they are saying that if you pay for the drugs, okay, you will be getting a license from the government to import the new seed strain. But you have to make a certain payment to get the license. In a further meeting, the same official says to L that you should donate money to a certain charity. And it is suggested by that official only, the one who has suggested L. So the official assures which uh, assures will then take the necessary steps to purchase and distribute the drugs. So first you pay, you'll be given a certificate by the government or license by the government. After that, you have to donate a certain amount of money to a certain charity that is also suggested by their own official. After that, you will be able to purchase and distribute the drugs. Okay. So understood the case? Now, so these are some actions that they can do. Combination of more than one they can do or one particular. Okay, so let us go through the list. First, due diligence they have to make due diligence when they are consulting with the staff member and any business partner it it has in country mc a country m is a new country to you right so they have to make a due diligence whenever they are dealing they are consulting with their staff member or any business partner because you have to satisfy yourself that you are making an arrangement which is legitimate and also you are following the rules and regulations of that country, the foreign country's rules and regulations. Okay. Now, they can obtain information also. Second, they can obtain on information on this too. Number one, the local law, M's local law. You have to know the information about M's local law because you are dealing with that and you are going to buy product from it. So you need to know. Okay on community benefits as part of a government procurement and if no particular lo local law is there what is the official status as well as the legitimacy of the arrangement that they are going to pay then they are going to get a license from the government what is that official status of that license is it legitimate does everyone get a license like that you have to check second what about the charity they have told that you have to donate you need what is the legal status of the charity you need to know what is the legal status what is this reputation in M? Whether this M, 
that they are saying that you donate and then we'll give you the product. Have they conducted similar projects before, before this, before our project? And do they have any connection with the charity? Who, the foreign official? Do they have any type of connection with the charity? If possible, you need information on this stuff. Before you decide whether you can actually donate to charities or not. See, when someone says donate to charity, you just cannot donate to any charity. Because not every charity is uh, legitimate. They don't have legal status, not every charity. You need to check because there are fraud also in the name of charity which is taking place. They, they might tell, okay, donate to this charity, this charity will give you this. Whereas it is some people who, you know, take your money and then run away. They just open a fake name in the name of a charity. It's not an actual charity. You have to make sure when you're donating your money to a charity, you have to check the legitimate status, whether it's uh, location, everything you need to check. And then you decide whether you're going to donate or not. Okay, same way here. So this actions also you can do. You can adopt an internal communication plan. That means inside your organization, you are, how are you going to communicate? You have to make a plan for it. Okay, and any uh, relationship that you are having with a charity, it has to be transparent in an open manner. It should not be very uh, kept secret or in a closed manner. No, everyone should know that the, this charity we are donating money. It should be very transparent. Okay. Next, adopting company-wide policies. When you are selecting charitable projects. Go by the company's policy. You have to assess the risk, how risky it could be. Then train and support your staff. Okay. Whenever you train your staff or you set up a procedure where they can communicate to you, any issue happens, they can easily come and communicate to you. Okay. Whether they are compliance with the rules or not, could be monitored easily. You train your staff. Now come into charitable donations. What about charitable donations? The made in country M. If you have to check whether it is channeled through government officials or not, routine leaders or not. Otherwise, a red flag should be raised. Because it could be, if it's through government official, okay. If it's through uh, others who are the officials that is suggesting to you, if they are the one who is running that charity, then a red flag should be raised. Okay. L can what what can they do? They can monitor how their fund is or their contributions are ultimately applied. Or they can go for alternative methods of donation. What is it? They can investigate for it, such as official offset or community gain with the government of M. You can go for it. And last, evaluate the policies that are relating to charitable donations. There will be so many policies on relatable donations. How you have to make a charitable donation and blah, blah, blah. Evaluate those policies. Okay, because those comes under anti-bribery procedures. What do you mean by anti-bribery procedure? You are bringing bribes, uh, you are not accepting any bribery procedures, you are bringing it down, maybe to nil zero. That is anti, opposite of bribery is anti-bribery. No bribery. Okay, so these are some things which you can do for when you are bribed, when you have to pay someone or you are receiving from someone, you have to do take actions. Usually when you have to pay someone. Welcome to section 11. Ethical decision making. So under ethical decision making, four things we are going to cover. Ethical knowledge, ethical sensitivity, ethical judgment and ethical behavior. It starts from knowledge, then sensitivity, then judgment, and then behavior. So, international, the IAESB, okay, they have this framework for making ethical decision. It starts with knowledge, sensitivity, judgment, and ethical behavior. So, this is like a model for making any ethical decisions, okay. Main references in this section is what to IAESB, International Accounting Education Standard Board. Okay, and and this they use using two models, which we are going to cover later in section 12. 
stage okay so first stage number one ethical knowledge is the first stage remember this follows in one a particular stage you cannot change the steps okay ethical knowledge is stage number one okay so here education focuses on what communicating the fundamental ethical knowledge about what is the value what are the ethics what are the attitudes okay so in education you have been educated about ethics what is ethics what is values what is professional values all those stuff then aim is for you to develop your ethical intelligence everyone is not ethically intelligent they might not know about ethical in depth so you have to be first ethically intelligent you have to get the knowledge about ethics from different ethical concept okay then this stage explains the fundamental theories and principles of ethics that's it you only know the theories and what are the principles of ethics at this stage once you have obtained it the knowledge accountants will then only understand what is the ethical framework within which they operate whether they are ethical how ethical they are in what situations they are following ethical and in what situations they are not being ethical they will understand it at this stage coming to stage number two which is ethical sensitivity what does it mean this stage applies the basic ethical principles from stage one to the actual work of accountant actually you are being ethical now you are sensitive now earlier you were just having the knowledge you're not applying anything here now you are practically applying it actually you are applying to the actual work what are the work auditing taxation consultancy any, anything any work what is the aim of this stage you can recognize ethical thread at this stage ethical sensitive you are very sensitive to ethics so at this stage if there are any threads you will recognize it at stage number 2 and the stage is developed by providing case studies and other learning aids to show how and where ethical threads can arise at this stage you are being shown some case studies some visual slides why so that you understand where the ethical threads can arise and in other words accountant is sensitized to ethical issues the areas where ethical threads appear can be identified this is that stage so identification of ethical threads is stage number 2 in short you can say coming to stage 3 where you are making some ethical judgment at this stage what what do you do this stage teaches the accountant how you can integrate and apply the ethical knowledge and sensitivity from stages 1 and 2 and form some reason and hopefully well informed decisions at here you are making the decision you are making a judgment based from your stage 1 and 2 stage 1 you have the knowledge bring forward apply it in stage 2 identify the ethical thread and in stage 3 based on that thread you now make a decision okay so here it helps the accountants to decide on ethical uh, what are their ethical priorities okay you are not making an ethical decision but you are making a judgment it's like a process well founded process okay so it is thought by applying ethical decision making models to ethical dilemmas showing how ethical judgment is being applied okay and finally stage 4 which is ethical behavior so at this stage what are you doing at this stage you should act ethical in all the situations accountant in any situation not just in workplace other situations also where the profession of accountancy must be upheld second ethical behavior is just more than believing in those ethical principles you have to act also on those principles okay in terms of lifelong education you have to be aware of ethical theory you have to be aware of the ethical thread okay and you have to continually seek to judge actions you have to be able to judge the action whether it's ethical or unethical based on what is expected ethical behavior that in this situation expected ethical behavior is this but that person is not acting based on it you are judging it now so teaching is primarily through case studies how are you, how are you being taught through someone uh, other people's example okay now ethical behavior what is it this is the last section of your lecture section 
okay so here issue related factor what are the issue and what are the so issue related factors one is based on an issue that is ethical issue moral intensity is one model moral framing is another model which we are going to cover then we have context based on a context how are you uh, showing your ethical behavior these are some cont uh, context related factor it could be based on the revolt based on the authority based on the bureaucracy work roles norm culture or national context okay we are going to cover this in depth in the lecture so ethical behavior issue related factors are two moral intensity and moral framing you see the how intense the morality is or you frame it based on a context or a situation context related factors are this five or six okay so ethical behavior is based on this this two based on our last topic that is last subtopic was what we stopped at ethical behavior that was our stage four from there we build up our section 12 the last section of this lecture lecture number two issue related factor for issue means how important the decision is to the decision maker then higher the intensity remember more likely the decision maker will make an ethical rather than an unethical decision if it has a higher intensity you are more likely to make an ethical decision because it's very intense no important very important so these are the factors that affects moral intensity number one concentration of effect is one factor what does it mean when effect of your action is on few people but it is very high concentrated then it is said that intensity is high whereas if it is affecting more people but very little 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 concentration is said to be less so if concentration is on few but it's high intensity is said to be high it increases your intensity that means you are going to be more ethical when the uh, concentration is high on few people understand because intensity is high in that condition proximity next factor what does proximity says the nearness the decision maker feels to the people affected by the decision if you feel you are very near to the people who are getting affected by your decision you are going to be more ethical for those people rather than people who are far away because when you are near again intensity increases third factor temporal immediacy what does it mean how soon immediacy means immediate okay just go by the word sound how soon the consequences of any effect are likely to occur if the consequences of what the action that you take okay is likely to occur soon you are going to be more ethical because intensity is high but if it takes a long time before the consequences are shown it's going to have a lower intensity that means you, are, you can be unethical in that condition fourth magnitude of consequence uh, consequence what does it mean what is the total sum of all the benefit or harm that is impacted by your problem if it's a problem then it's harm if it's an action it could be benefit what is the impact the sum of it the total okay the financial loss that is caused by a faulty advice if you are giving a wrong advice what is the financial loss if it's very high you are going to be high you are going to be ethical otherwise unethical because we are talking here from ethical behavior how it's going to affect your ethical behavior all this moral intensity and everything is just a model to understand why we are behaving in a certain way ethically factors because based on this factor social consensus, uh, consensus what does it mean degree to which people agree over ethics of a problem or an action if people agree over certain thing right you are going to be ethical if they think this is ethical you are going to act in that way act deemed unethical by others if it something is considered unethical you are not going to act you are going to go by the majority what the people say what the people agree probability of effect this means the likelihood whether the harm or the benefit that will actually happen higher this probability highest intensity that means you are going to act more ethical okay understand so these are the six factor now we are moving to moral framing that is the next model from there 
they were intensity based on the intensity of it you are going to behave ethically here it's about frame you frame in a situation moral issues are discussed in a workplace okay a problem or a dilemma can made to be can uh, they can look like that they are very inoffensive if they are framed in a certain way okay some things which might look unethical in the first instance if you change the scenario or frame it in a certain way it might look less uh, unethical right you just frame it in another way so what happens this may lead to people in different organizations pursuing moral intensity differently why because if you change the frame if, if you are framing it in a different way more not just on based on moral intensity then for different organizations it will mean different things moral intensity because every organization will not frame it in the same way no two people will never frame it in the same way so for them it will be different where morals are discussed openly decision making is likely to be more ethical remember when you are discussing morals about morals ethics values openly you are going to be more ethical whatever decision you are going to make is going to be more ethical second use of moral words if you are using highly this words in your organization integrity honest i want an honest uh, employee for my company i don't like lying i am against i hate stealing there should be no stealing what does it imply that means your decision making again is going to be ethical that means ethically you are going to behave again third however many businesses use moral muteness what does it mean which means that morals are rarely discussed now what is business if you see rarely you will see they discuss morals openly that means ethical decision they are going to be unethical i'm not saying 100% is like that but they are likely to be like that okay ethical decision will suffer there they cannot be very ethical because they don't like to talk about morals means what they are not going to take moral decisions so before i go to the context related factor this was issue related factor before i go to the context related factor let us finish test your understanding 6 relate into moral moral framing test your understanding 6 the last uh, test your understanding here you are supposed to explain the moral intensity of the following situations three situations are given let's see you have to say whether it's high or low first one you are advising a client and you are giving them incorrect uh, advice regarding tax planning and it causes several thousand dollars to your client second you are reading a newspaper saying that uh, there are some poor working conditions because of that and it's in a remote country okay not a uh, uh, neighbor country or something which indicates that this conditions can cause cancer for 10% of the worker and the third one is you falsify an expense claim to include lunch for your spouse or a partner because this is a normal business uh, normal behavior for your work group so in the first one where you are uh, giving a wrong advice tax advice see the magnitude of the loss it's not high overall because it's just one client if you see and just few thousand dollars loss right but you are affecting one person and that person is close to you because he's your client you're close to that person It's affecting one. That therefore, the moral intensity in this condition is high because when it's affecting uh, one person or few person, but the impact is more, the loss is more. It is said that moral intensity is high, and when it's affecting lot of people, but the impact is less by a small amount, then it's not intense. But here it's just one person, but the effect is uh, more on that one person, even though. overall loss if you calculate it's in thousands dollar loss is not so much but intensity is high second regarding newspaper okay this situation is some distance away remote country it's not near to you so in terms of proximity is far away from you therefore any effect of action that you do will not be felt for some years some years you will not feel any action therefore in this condition moral intensity is low third one where you are falsifying an expense claim okay for the lunch that you have given to your spouse or someone this ad is deemed ethical it looks ethical okay 
if it looks if it is then the intensity is likely to be low in this case why because there are unlike because you are unlikely to be get caught there are low probability of this effect that means that means low intensity when you're having low probability of getting caught by someone intensity is low okay intensity is low means you have a very high chance of being unethical in this kind of case even in the um, second one also newspaper thing you have a very high chance of being unethical because intensity is not felt effect is not felt for many years but in the first one where moral intensity is high you want to add ethical okay intensity is high means you are more likely to add ethical intensity is low means you are less likely to be ethical please understand this and before i uh, finish this i would like to say that uh, do not memorize these answers this type of question do not expect in your exam it will not come this is it. this is just for your understanding of what you have gone through the uh, lecture or the chapter it is just for this understanding how much you have understood moral intensity can you apply it to a question that's why this test your understanding is there that's the only purpose whether to a particular situation you are able to identify this is high this is low the what is the impact that's it okay don't expect such type of questions in exam so that's it for test your understanding six context related factor so this factors relate to how a particular issue would be viewed within a certain context for example if certain behaviors are rewarded or encouraged or demanded by superiors even though they are ethically dubious what does it mean decision making may be affected if you are rewarded for unethical behavior or encouraged or demanded by superiors what does it mean that ethical decision will be affected okay if everyone in workplace does something in a certain way any new individual that is going to come in that workplace are going to follow the same way right this could be better in terms of ethical behavior if it's good or lower standards of it could be the it could bring down your standard if your ethical behavior is that's not the right way right you are not acting ethically so it could be in any way higher or lower standard managers they reframe their moral decisions into organizational or practical issues for one of these three reasons even if the decision is moral they will see whether it is practical as well or not why number 1 harmony okay harmony believe that moral talk would promote confrontation and recrimination what does it mean the more you talk about moral okay easily someone can come and confront you right they don't want that number 2 efficiency just by talking okay moral talk could cloud issues making decision making more time consuming to make decision which is also ethical becomes a bit difficult right when you keep on talking morally the more issues you talk moral issues decision making becomes slower so it affects your efficiency first one is harmony it's affecting harmony because no one wants to get confronted right third image of power and effectiveness if they think that they are idealistic their image is going to suffer that's what managers believe if they make decisions solely for ethical reasons they feel that they are going, uh, their power their effectiveness is going to get affected right so that's just an imagination okay but the reality is something else so because of these three reasons they want to reframe their moral decisions if they know it's morally correct but still they want to reframe but that is practically it is uh, uh, reliable or practical it is feasible to go ahead with the decisions or not they reframe the managers based on the context based on the scenario however where the approach to moral elements tends to be principle based what does it mean then reframing moral decision is inappropriate if it's principle based then you don't have to reframe if it's a rule based yes 
that certain rules are not okay for you you change but if it's principle based principle based or open ended it's, it's general so there you don't have to reframe your moral decisions is inappropriate if you do that because there are no rules to follow in moral or principle based that's why you have to discuss this ethics because it is general it is principle based you have to discuss ethics you have to justify the actions based on ethical judgment that's it now let us go through the factor system of rewards how this is going to affect your ethical decision making any reward which is based on achievement for example number of sales that someone makes they might be they might be unethical sometimes why to increase the sales they just purely they are worried about their reward which is which can only be which they can only achieve by increasing the number of sales whether it is an ethical decision or unethical decision they don't care okay also in an organization if unethical behaviors are not punished from very beginning it is going to support that okay unethical decision is going to take place it's going to increase if the higher level people support such behavior unethical decision will increase second authority authority is the second factor authority means when junior managers when they follow instructions from senior managers so if a senior manager makes an unethical decision it is very likely that even junior managers today or tomorrow they will also be going in the same footstep because the senior managers what are they doing they are, they are just not doing uh, making an unethical decision they are setting the ground they are setting a culture for the juniors to do that as well okay third bureaucracy bureaucracy says just follow the rules okay just do paperwork that's what bureaucracy tells that's what employees think okay so if there are more bureaucracy what does it mean ethical decision will suffer okay ethical decision will suffer then work rules managers what do they do they want to follow the work rule that is expected from them okay even if they are ethical as an accountant why will they be ethical only because it is expected from them that they will be behaving ethically not because they want to be ethical or they think it's the right thing okay in other roles where ethics are believed to be compromised there are some roles where ethics could be compromised regularly there they will not be ethical there they will be less ethical so it changes ethics changes for them based on their work rules if it is expected to be ethical they will be ethical otherwise no organizational uh group norms and culture sometimes ethical ethical behavior can come from your culture also that would be our next lecture in fact culture of the organization because managers when they work in a group they tend to share the norms okay what is described as an unethical behavior overall they may be they may be ethical for the group the groups think that it might be ethical for them one example is okay a group may decide that copying the work related software at home is ethical so what happens all the members in that group participate in that way only they think yes, it is ethical so we'll copy it from home then national and cultural context different countries has different culture okay so because they have different culture ethics will be different for them okay where a decision is ethically correct or not may therefore depend on the specific culture okay it depends on the specific culture whether it is ethically right or not now so that's it with this i have summarized my lecture number 2 of sbl that is professions and core of ethics and public interest now let us summarize in all the 12 sections what we have covered this is a diagram which i have created even okay it is there at the end of your chapter also from your textbook it summarizes everything it's easy so that you can refresh what you have covered so for professional corporate ethics number 1 we have covered profession what is it characteristics we have linked it to the accounting profession okay and what is professionalism so profession has three things body of theory common code and duty to society then professionalism 
they comply with laws and ethical standards not just law but ethical standards as well as well and they do not bring discredit okay next we covered the public interest public interest was the next second section what is public interest it's supposed the good of the society as a whole then we covered accountants role and influence in the organization in the society and over the distribution of power and wealth then we covered corporate ethics under corporate ethics we covered how you apply the ethics ethical values to the business behavior and then we covered did corporate codes okay they assist in resolving your ethical di uh, dilemmas then professional code of ethics professional code of ethics we have some uh, ethical principles for the members and the students to any professional body could be acca cma cpa okay acc is code what are their content and principles the five fundamental principles integrity objectivity confidentiality professional behavior professional competence and due care so the five we covered conflicts of interest and thread threats to independence the five threats to independence we did what are they self interest self review advocacy familiarity and intimidation thread remember the five principles and five thread link them together and finally the safeguard by using the conceptual framework of core of ethics profession to safeguard and the work environment so through this you safeguard the conflicts of thread so that's so overall this is what we have covered throughout this lecture i know it's a very long lecture but uh, one needs to go through it because it's really really very important from the point of your exam you will get an ethics question and i don't know how for how many marks it could be for 12 marks 10 marks 5 marks 6 marks whatever the marks does not count but what counts is ethics will come ethic is a part of every paper in sb uh, in acc especially in b levels because your professional skill is for ethics ethical question in any paper whether it is tax whether it is audit whether it is apm afm sbr okay only for spl it is a question uh, syllabus is there for ethics so i hope that this lecture will help you to overcome your challenges of ethics in your other papers also as well as sbl so best of luck and see you in lecture number 3 where i'll be covering the organizational culture that is one lecture left under leadership before we go to a section 2 of our syllabus section b so till then thank you for watching do take care and see you in the next video